please akshi are we ready yes ma'am recording started okay please go ahead sunil uh good evening everyone uh, so today we will uh, have a quiz which is on the urine examination just a so uh today uh, we are uh, going to have a urine examination symposium which is a very important uh, topic in nephrology and we have stalwarts uh, with us and just to warm up we are having a small quiz for the uh, pg students uh, which is on the urine examination we will be having a total eight contestants which uh, have qualified from uh, from the 40 contestants which have uh, joined the pre qualifying round yesterday eight of them have been now uh, they will be playing uh, for the final rounds and uh, we will be giving three questions to uh, each contestant uh, each contestant will get three question consecutively and dr shabana is with me who would do the scoring and uh, shabana uh, uh, will keep a track of the uh, who would be doing the next contestant so uh, the sequence of the contestants will be decided by shabana so with this uh, i would like to uh, show you the rules so the rules of the quiz are there will be uh, three question to each candidate and each correct answer will be given plus 5 mark and each wrong answer will be given minus 2 marks and uh, the contestant will get 30 seconds to answer one question and uh, if uh, there is any controversy related to the answer or anything uh, the decision of uh, the judges would be final so with this uh, we uh, start with our quiz uh, shabana who is the first candidate first candidate is dr yogesh ma'am yes dr yogesh are you ready yes ma'am so the first question for dr yogesh is calcium oxalate crystals in the urine may be seen in all of the following conditions except crohn's disease vitamin c ingestion ethylene glycol ingestion fabris disease and celiac disease your time starts now and fabris disease fabris disease is a correct answer so he gets plus 5 marks as you can see oxalate crystals may occur with any cause of enteric fat malabsorption such as crohn's disease celiac disease it is basically ethylene glycol on metabolism which results in oxalate formation which is the cause of kidney injury in these cases so high dose vitamin c ingestion and its resulting metabolism may, may also result in the oxalate formation but in patients with fabris disease they have a urine particles with asymmetrical maltase cross bodies and other polarizing light crystals and not the uh, uh, this oxalate crystals next question for yogesh uh, name this crystal and uric acid needle shape uric acid crystals uric acid crystals uh that's a wrong answer the correct answer is two, uh, two white crystal white okay it gets minus 2 for this the third question for yogesh which of the following scenario describes the polyuria due to solute diuresis daily urine output 3 liters per day with urine osmolality 100 second scenario daily urine output 4 liters with osmolality of 200 third scenario is daily urine output of 3 liters with osmolality of 300 and fourth situation is daily urine output of 4 liters per day with urine osmolality of 400 your time starts now ma'am option d option d is the correct answer daily urine output of 4 liters in urine osmolality 400 ml mole per kg polyuria can be classified as solute diuresis or water diuresis or mixed polyuria solute diuresis is characterized by an abnormally high daily excretion of urinary osmoles that is more than 900 associated with urinary osmolality greater than 300 so the daily excretion of urinary osmol osmol is calculated by the multiplying the daily urine output 
by the urinary osmolality that is 4 liters into 400 which is 1600 milligrams so under these circumstances a solute such as glucose urea mannitol or electrolytes all obliged to water excretion now the next question is for the next contestant shabana who is the next contestant dr praful yes good evening ma'am good evening praful the question for you is which of the following drugs has not been uh, shown to cause direct crystal urea ciprofloxacin endenavir olistat trimetrin ciprofloxacin a ma'am sorry it is the wrong answer the correct answer is orlistat it gets minus 2 orlistat uh, may indirectly cause crystal urea via fat malabsorption inducing oxaluria and subsequent crystal urea the other drugs may directly cause crystal urea in the urine ciprofloxacin may induce urinary crystals although this is rarely thought to cause acute kidney injury indinavir also causes crystal uh, characteristic star like and plate like crystals and trimetrin is the new drug which has been found to also having caused crystal urea so now the next question for you is how often bodies are uh, in, these are the inclusion bodies seen in kidney by electron microscopy in bkv nephropathy these are the viral particles seen in kidney in electron microscopy in jc virus nephropathy these are the cast like aggregates seen in electron microscopy in urine with bkb nephropathy and these are the vi viral particles seen in kidney in el electron microscopy in adenovirus nephropathy the uh, time starts now a ma'am a inclusion body is seen oh uh, sorry it's a wrong answer the correct answer is cast like yes. aggregates seen in electron microscopy in urine with bkb nephropathy so he gets minus 2 next question for you prakul true about urine anion gap is all except a positive urine urinary anion gap that is generally between 20 to 90 is usually indicative of renal etiology of renal tubular acidosis option b results near zero between plus 20 and minus 20 can not be relied cannot can not reliably interpreted option c keto acidosis has no effect on urine anion gap and option d urine anion gap is usually unreliable in neonates your time starts now c ma'am keto acidosis has no effect in urine anion c that's that's a correct answer keto acidosis has no effect on urine anion gap is the correct answer so unmeasurable anions affect the anion gap also so the next uh, next candidate shubhana soundarya ma'am dr soundarya good evening ma'am yeah good evening ma'am good evening the question for you is identify this arrowed objects are they the waxy cast hyaline cast rbc cast Or granular cast. Hyaline cast. Uh, sorry, the correct answer is waxy cast. Now the next question for you. After receiving a twenty-four hours urine for quantitative total protein analysis, the technician must first either the subculture the urine. must first subculture the urine for bacteria add the appropriate for uh, per preservative option c screen for albumin using dipstick and option d measure the volume your time starts now it's c ma'am screen for albumin using a dipstick uh, sorry the correct answer is measure the total volume see basically when you measure measure the total volume of sample before removing the aliquot uh, to calculate the total protein measure the protein of an aliquot to learn the milligrams per per deciliter and then you have to multiply that answer by the number of dl uh, number of dl in 24 hour urine collection so first step step is to measure the total volume so you get minus 2 here next question 
for you. A clean catch urine is submitted to the laboratories for urine uh, urine analysis and culture. The routine urine analysis is done first, and three hours later, the specimen is sent to the microbiology department for the culture. What you would do to this sample now? Would you centrifuge and uh, supernatant is cultured, or would you uh, would you reject due to time delay, or not to be cultured if no bacteria are seen, or it is we proposed for culture only if the nitrate is positive. So, uh, A, ma'am. So you would centrifuge, and uh, the supernatant will be culture. That is the answer, right? Yes, ma'am. Option A. Sorry, that's a wrong answer. The correct answer is it. We have to reject this sample because if the samples are shared between the labs. Uh, between the microbiology department and the uh, uh, urinalysis department. Ideally, the culture is set up first to prevent contamination. If it is not feasible time-wise, the sample should be allocated using aseptic technique and the refrigeration until it is cultured. So you get minus two here. Shavana? Next, next is Dr. Bharati. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. The question for Dr. Bharati, which of the following urine results is most apt to be changed prolonged exposure to light? pH, protein, ketones, and bilirubin. Uh, bilirubin, madam. Bilirubin is the correct answer. Bilirubin is graded by light. The other analytics will not be affected by light. So the correct answer is bilirubin. He gets plus five for this. Second question for Dr. Bharati. Identify the objects. The top one is polarized light and bottom is a regular light. First is RTs, that is renal tubular uh, cells, epithelial cells, oval fat bodies. Option C is Leucine crystals and option D is WBC cast. Your time starts now. It is uh, oh, oval fat bodies, madam. Oval fat bodies is the correct answer. Uh, he gets plus five for this. Good going. Third question. Urine sample should be examined within one hour of widening because RBCs, leukocytes, and cast agglutinate on standing for several hours at room temperature. Option B, urobilinogen increases and bilirubin decreases after prolonged exposure to light. Option C, bacterial contamination will cause alkalinization of the urine. And option D, ketones will increase due to bacterial and cellular metabolism. Your time. That's not. I'll go for B, madam. B. Urobilinogen increases, bilirubin decreases after prolonged. Sorry, that's a wrong answer. The correct answer is bacterial contamination will cause alkalinization of the urine. Basically, uh, A is incorrect because these cells don't agglutinate. RBCs, leukocytes, they don't agglutinate. Option B, that is partially correct, but it but urobilinogen decreases with light. Okay, ma'am. Option C is true that bacterial overgrowth does lead to an alkaline urine. And option D is false because the ketones are produced by fat metabolism in the patients. So you get minus two for the third question. Shabana, who's the next candidate? Next is Bendelam Gautami. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, the question for uh, you is, the fluid leaving the glomerulus normally has a specific gravity of 1.001, 1.010, 1.020, 1 and 1.030. Um, Ma'am, uh, 
C one point zero two zero. Sorry, it's a wrong mm -hmm. answer. The correct answer is B. E one point zero one zero. Next question for you. The following results are obtained on urine specimen at eight a.m. If this urine specimen was stored uncapped at three at five degrees centigrade without preservation and this uh, retested at two p.m., which of the following test results would be changed due to this storage condition? A glucose, B ketone, C protein, and D nitrite. Ma'am, the nitrite. Sorry, the correct answer is ketone. Basically, the sample is mistreated by being uncapped. It is refrigerated, which will prevent bacteria from producing. So nitrate will not shed, but and from metabolizing glucose. So as it is, uh, so ketones can evaporate, but protein will not. And uh, I think this is the third question for her. No, ma'am. Two are done. Yeah. Uh, the third question uh, is a urine specimen collected on an apparently healthy 25 years old man shortly after he finished eating a lunch, which was cloudy. The sample was cloudy, but it showed some normal results on multiple reagents. Uh, with the st uh, strip analysis, it was showing normal results. The most likely cause of the turbidity is A, fat, B, white blood cells, C, urate, and D, phosphates. Um, Ma'am, phosphates? Yes, phosphates is the correct answer. She gets plus five for this answer. Next candidate? Naina Patel. Naina Patel, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Naina, the question for you is, the principle of reagent strip test for urine protein depends on an enzyme reaction. Option B is protein error of indicators. Option C, copper reduction. And option D, the toluidin reaction. Um, it is protein error of indicators. Absolutely right answer. The protein error of indicator. Testing for protein is based on the phenomenon called protein error of indicator. That is the ability of uh, protein to alter the color of the some acid-based indicators without altering the pH. So in solution uh, void of protein, tetrabromophenol blue preferred at pH 3 is yellow. So next question. Which of the following reagents is used to react with ketones in the urine. Sodium nitroglycide, acetoacetic acid, acetone, or beta hydroxybutyric acid. Hmm. Uh, Ma'am, it is sodium uh, nitroglycide. Yeah, that's the correct answer. It is the sodium nitroglycide. You get plus five for this. And the third question, identify the question. A, ammonium biorate crystal, B, leucine crystal, option C, oxalate crystal, and option D, triple phosphate crystal. Ma'am, it is ammonium biorate crystal. That's the correct answer, ammonium biorate crystal. Basically, ammonium biorate crystal uh, are yellowish brown and can be seen in thrown apple shape that is round with thorny projects or it is spherical in form. The presence of ammonium biorate crystals usually indicate an old poorly preserved specimen. So she gets plus five for this. And Dr. Mukesh. Dr. Mukesh? Yes, ma'am. Yes. The question for you is 
urine that develops a port wine color after standing may contain melanin porphyrin bilirubin or urobilin ma'am porphyrin ma'am porphyrin is the correct answer very quick one next question for you clue cells are form of squamous epithelial cells Euro urothelial cells, white blood cells, or re renal tubular epithelial cell. Ma'am, renal tubular epithelial cell, ma'am. D D D for Delhi. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, it's the wrong answer. The correct answer is a squamous epithelial cell. The clue cells are present. The uh, clue cells represent the attachment of bacterium. Gardnerella vaginalis is to the squamous epithelial cells. Gardnerella causes vaginal infection, and the cells lining the vagina are the squamous epithelial cells. Uh, this is a now the third question for him. This is third question. Yeah. The urine microscopy uh, constitutes that best differentiate between cyst cystitis and pyelonephritis are. WBCs, bacteria, RBCs, and WBC cast. Ma'am, WBC cast, ma'am. Absolutely right answer. Very easy. Plus five for this. Next candidate, Doctor Sona, ma'am. Doctor Sona. Doctor Sona is there. Dr. Sona, Shabana, can we go to the next candidate before? Uh, she is the last one. She is the last one. Uh -huh. She was there. She actually she joined. Uh, can Hello, type, S, S, uh, if she can type the answer on chat box A B C D, we can. I can project the question. She has joined, Doctor Suna. Suna has joined. Okay. So, question for Arun. She has joined, ma'am. Yeah. The so confirmatory test for a positive protein results by the reagent strip method uses enriched reagent. A diazo reaction, sulfosalicylic acid, a copper reduction tablet. Sulfosalicylic acid. Yeah, that's the right answer. Sulfosalicylic acid. So very easy and simple. Next question for you. After warming a cloudy urine, it clears. This is a due to the presence of urates, phosphates, WBCs, or bacteria. Phosphates. Sorry, it's the wrong answer. The correct answer is urates. And third question for you: Which of the following scenario is most consistent with the diagnosis of di central diabetes insipidus? An increase in urine osmolality from two hundred and fifty to five hundred milliosmoles after an overnight water restriction in a patient. Uh, on phenoth uh, phenothiazone therapy, which changes minimally after desmopressin administration. Option B, an increase in serum sodium from 138 to 149 after overnight water restriction with an AM urine specific gravity of less than 1.005 that rises to 1.030 after administration of desmopressin. And option C is an increase in urine osmolality from 200 to 240. Uh, After administration of desmopressin in patients on chronic lithium therapy with a serum sodium level of one fifty one. B, answer B. Answer B is the correct answer. An increase in serum sodium from one thirty eight to one forty nine. So I think uh, we have finished with the quiz. She got all three questions right. Shabnam, we are finished with the candidates.
Shabana? Shabana, can you give us the uh, um, result of this? Or you can type Shabana. Unmute yourself, Shabana. Unmute. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, yes, Dr. Sonal. Shabana, unmute yourself. She is not able to unmute herself, uh, Dr. Sonal. Just give me a minute. Dr. Sonal, I think the results, let it be uh, finalized between you both so that we can have the final result at the end of the whole session since it's reaching okay. six. I think we have all the speakers. Welcome, Dr. Velez. I was uh, uh, trying to text you. Oh, can you please rejoin, Dr. Velez? Can you hear us? Dr. Velez, yes. Can you please rejoin, logging out or uh, you can rejoin. We have Dr. Selzer and Dr. Joseph joined already with us. Dr. Willis, if you have joined, if your audio and video is good, we'll start the sessions right now. Sakshi, can you please just hold on for a minute of the uh, projection of the slides? I'm just waiting for Dr. Velez to join. Okay, okay. Yes. Dr. Velez, you have joined? Yes, I mean, are you in the attendee? Yeah, let me check. Yeah, uh, Sakshi, can you promote Dr. Velez to panelists, please, right now? Yeah, you're yeah, done, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Velez, are you with us? No, I can't see in the panel, uh, Sakshi. Now, see you again, ma'am. Yes. Welcome, Dr. Velez. Yes, Sakshi, can you morning. please stop sharing your screen? Can we have the... Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Velez. Good morning good to evening, you. Good morning, good morning for us. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> So shall we start the program? We had an exciting quiz just now for about half an hour or something. So, I mean, uh, we get the sessions going right now with all the speakers who have joined with us and with all the uh, chairpersons who have joined with us. We have an amazing attendance right now. So we start the session right away without much ado. Good evening, good morning all. Welcome to this exciting symposium on urinary microscopy, which is in fact an imminent and pertinent topic, uh, which is a basic examination that is in need for all the practicing nephrologists, to diagnose particular diseases, almost all diseases which are related to the kidney. So we have an amazing line of speakers with us today, Dr. Jay Selzer and Dr. Uh, uh, Carlos Velez, 
and Dr. Poloni with us, who are speaking to us from US early in the morning, and Dr. Poloni from Brazil, uh, morning 9 a.m. for them. So they will be speaking to us on various topics which are of uh, importance to us in daily practice. So without much ado, I invite all the panelists, all the amazing speakers, and all the attendees of today's session to join us for this exciting session. Now, going up to the first session, we have with us the moderators joining us today, Dr. Anuradha Raman, who is the senior nephrologist of the country, former president, Indian Society, and uh, advisor of Women Nephrology India Group, a consultant practicing nephrologist at one of the corporate hospitals of Telangana State of India. Along with the, uh, Dr. Nradha Raman will be chairing Dr. Narayan Prasad, who is the professor and head of Department Nephrology, one of the premier institutes from Lucknow SDPGI India. He is secretary of Indian Society of Nephrology. Along with them joining co-chair is Dr. Gangada Taduri, who is professor and head again from one of the premier institutes of India, Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences. Without much ado, may I request the uh, moderators of this session to take over and introduce the uh, speakers of today's program of the first session. Over to the moderators, please. Sakshi, can you just project the slides of introduction? Thank you, uh, Dr. Manjusha. Uh, good evening and good morning to all the speakers and all the attendees of this exciting symposium on urinary microscopy. We all know that the naked eye appearance of the urine must have been studied by healers since the Stone Age. Uroscopy, which is an elaborate interpretation, began around 600 AD. The first Primitive monocular microscope appeared in Netherlands in 19, 1680. Clinical urine microscopy was pioneered by Rare at his pupils in Paris in the late 1830s, spread to UK and Germany in 1840s. And after nearly 100 years, about from 1900, the polarized and the phase contrast microscopy came into existence. And from 1980, the mission assisted observations began and have dominated the progress since then. We are, as Dr. Thomas Addis, the famous Scottish physician scientist once remarked, when the patient dies, the kidneys may go to the pathologist, but while he's alive, the urine is all ours. It can provide us day by day, month by month, and year by year with a serial story of major events within the kidney. And therefore examination of urine is the one of the most important essential part of physical examination for any nephrology resident. We have uh, participating in this symposium, we have three very, well, very renowned international speakers as also a host of national, national participants. And without wasting much time on the first topic, we have uh, Dr. J. Selzer, who is chief of nephrology at uh, Missouri Baptist Medical Center he has special interest in urine microscopy and uh, urinary sediment. Joining him is uh, Dr. Velez, who is an academic nephrologist at the Oshner Nephro and Oshner Health uh, at the Oshner's Clinical School uh, at New Orleans, uh, New Orleans, USA. Without wasting much time, I would invite uh, our international faculty to deliberate on this very important uh, topic of uh, urine exam. And uh, over to you, this stage is all yours. Thank you everyone for the invitation. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yeah. Dr. Bill. Okay, good, good. Um, so my talk is going to focus on actually performing urine microscopy. Uh, first of all, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. We'll start by talking about sample preparation. Uh, Dr. Velez will join me with a presentation on that topic. Then we'll focus on how to use the microscope properly. Uh, as you can imagine, in order to interpret the urinary sediment, you have to be able to see what's there. And that requires having skill in using the microscope properly to get clear images. We'll then focus on identifying cells, casts, and lipids in the urine, 
talk briefly about how to document findings and correlate with clinical disorders, and then talk about a few resources uh, to learn more. For sample preparation, uh, it's important to use fresh urine. If the patient has a catheter, it must be urine from the tubing, not from the bag. Um, you'll take time to perform the dipstick testing because the pH, specific gravity, the presence or absence of protein, blood, and leukocytes might help you decide what you're looking at. Um, you'll use a conical bottom tube um, filled with urine, uh, centrifuge. The speed, um, <clears throat> it kind of depends on how concentrated the urine is. Uh, most labs will spin at 1500 RPMs, which is a relative centrifugal force of 400 for five minutes. But if you have a particularly dilute specimen, you can spin it at a slightly higher rate for longer. Uh, you then pour off the supernatant, uh, leaving only half a milliliter, resuspend the sediment, use a pipette to transfer a small drop to a glass slide, and then apply a cover slip, trying to prevent air bubbles from forming. Uh, there are a couple different stains that are quite useful in evaluating the urinary sediment. The most commonly used is the Sternheimer Malbin stain, which is a super vital stain composed of crystal violet and safranin. It greatly facilitates identification of white cells, epithelial cells, and the protein matrix of casts. The color that you see and degree of staining depends on the duration of exposure and the pH, but also due to the viability of the cells. Uh, selective permeability of viable cells allows them to resist stain uptake, whereas non-viable or damaged cells are readily stainable. After the usual preparation, it's quite simple. You add one drop of the stain to the resuspended sediment and mix gently, usually allowing one to two minutes uh, for stain uptake before placing the drop on the slide. The Sudan 3 stain uh, is useful for identifying lipids, particularly when you don't have polarization available. Um, it is a lipophilic stain. It will stain lipids in orange red color. Uh, it's also simple to use. You add anywhere from two to five drops to the resuspended sediment, but it does require a little longer for stain uptake, usually 10 or 15 minutes before placing the drop on the slide. This is just a very, very brief video. Uh, Dr. Velez will go into a little more detail, uh, but this is just the process of, uh, that I use, uh, adding a single drop to the resuspended sediment. Um, gently mixing, uh, probably uh, better using the pipette by drawing up and down the mixture. And normally we would let this sit for about 30 to 90 seconds to allow for stain uptake, but here, we're just going to place a drop on the glass slide. And then applying the cover slip, um, I'll usually tilt the slide slightly <clears throat> and allow the drop to make contact with the cover slip, which is put down at an angle. And once it makes contact with one side of the cover slip, we'll gently lower the other side the goal here is to make sure that you have a thin preparation with no air bubbles. Uh, you don't want too much liquid on the slide so that it comes out under the cover slip. You want a very thin layer because otherwise uh, there may be different items on different focal planes. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Velez for a more detailed review here. Dr. Velez, uh, pathologist for Oxford Health. Thank you for uh, participating. So we're going to do a quick demonstration of a uh, method to uh, process the urine and prepare it for microscopy. Uh, the method I'm going to show is not the only absolute way to do it. It's the way that I, the protocol that we follow here. Uh, now there might be some variations depending on, on where you read or who does it. But for the most part, uh, we're just minor deviation from what I want to show today. So first of all, you got to uh, collect the urine specimen. Um, and uh, usually you would ask the nurse in the room or the patient in the kitchen or health cell to provide a urine specimen. Um, and uh, we receive the urine specimen on a urine cup. Um, we try to ask uh, for a clean patch, but sometimes the patients aren't able to, 
to void and we also for a straight uh, in and out catheter uh, to correct the urine. Uh, sometimes patients are connected to uh, suction and negative pressure um, and that at the urine uh, pulls a lot of springs of epithelial cells which is not ideal so I don't uh, not to use those vessels. Um, but uh, often patients are not uh, able to provide a specimen. They are in a tested trade unit uh, in a holy catheter, or it could be on the floor with a holy catheter. So we have to always I have here a, a holy catheter kit, and you can see here uh, the container where sometimes we see the urine being collected. We try not to collect the urine from uh, this container because uh, a lot of times has been sitting there for hours where bacterial colonization can make the urine pH a little alkaline and that may affect the stability of the, the integrity of the casts. So we don't try to collect there. So what, what I try to do is collect urine. Uh, this is a fully catheter. As you can see here, this is inserted into the patient's bladder and the urine as it comes out of the bladder is gonna come here in the tube. So if you collect urine from the tubing, it's going to be relatively fresh. So that's what we try to do. So we obtain a 10 cc syringe that's available at any, uh, any hospital floor or ICU. And we come to this um, site of the catheter and screw it in. So it's important to come here, apply some force and screw it in and go ahead and aspirate the urine as it comes out, you know, about 10 mLs or whatever you can get. And you get the urine. Usually they have a cap tip on the floor and you seal it and take it to, to the lab. It's important uh, to be aware that you don't want to be confused with this end. Uh, this is where the, uh, the water is uh, infused to create, put the bubble in, in, uh, in the cap and secure it. Uh, so believe it or not, uh, I've been cases where of water was aspirated incorrectly. So it's important to note this is where we collect the urine from. Okay. Um, so once we collect the urine, that's, uh, here is a sample that in this particular case uh, came from the pump. So we're going to transfer the urine to the tube. This is a, a 15 ml tube available, a Falcon tube in the lab. The first thing we do is we label. So in this case, we're going to call it uh, patient X. If the tube is labeled, and we're going to transfer the urine specimen to the tube. When we do that, there's no secret there. It's going to be transferred. In this case, um, it's a little bit more than 10 ml. So let's say we have 10 ml, that's enough. Uh, you can do less or more than 10, but because we try to do it standardized, we have here the 10 ml of urine. Um, and this is going to go into the centrifuge. We have a 10 ml balance here, and it's going to go right across. Um, and we're going to seal it and go ahead and centrifuge this uh, for two to five minutes at a 1500 G force. Okay, so once uh, you uh, place the tube in the centrifuge, you have three to five minutes of waiting time. So this is a good time to label your slides. Um, it's important to do that. You don't want to prepare a slide that is not labeled. If you are inspecting more than one specimen, you get confused with another patient. I do uh, uh, evaluate, and that is obviously a, a, a problem. So, this is what I'm talking about. I label this again patient X. I'm going to prepare two separate slides in this particular case, and uh, we're going to get ready. So here is the tube. We've already completed the uh, centrifugation process. The first thing we do is we look at the pellet. And now you can see in this tube is a very, very large pellet, very sizable. I would say this is a larger pellet than the average. We're not likely to get these pellets every day, every patient. But uh, it's obviously a good pellet for inspection. So the next step is going to be to remove the supernatant the urine that is um, uh, the supernatant part of the urine. Now, um, this is something that standard laboratories would, have, would be either one ml or half ml, sort of a standard protocol for every patient. 
So they have to quantify red cells, white cells, their high output, et cetera. So they need to follow a systematic protocol. However, because we do it for direct clinical care, we, we were looking for answers such as yes and no questions about presence protocols, we try to get the best possible talent. So for that reason, what I would typically do is get rid of as much superbank as I can. In this case, the pellet is so large that I may not do that. So what I would do normally is I would do this vertically, let the urine drop completely. And I typically would keep the tube dripping. And once you flip it, there's enough urine that sticks to the tube by superficial tension. But in this case, I didn't let it drip because the pellet was so large that it's probably good that we leave some super apex so we can resuspend. It's already resuspended. This is a very uh, large, milky, dark uh, uh, urine pellet that we're ready for play. Stop. Okay, so we're getting ready to prepare the slides. So here is a pipette that is, should be available in any lab. And here is a pellet. So we're going to prepare. Uh, we're going to see here, it's important not to overload the specimen of this slide. So this is a significant uh, a, a material here. You don't want to drop the entire material here. So as you can see, you squeeze gently and let one small drop. That is enough. I'm not going to put all this urine. Placing an excessive amount of urine is going to create a very thick layer. <coughs> which is going to be actually uh, more difficult to identify in the right individual structure. So you don't want to, you want to have a very thin film of urine specimen cover uh, on the, in a place on the slide. So once you have that, I'm going to bring down a clover slip. And there are different ways to put the clover slip. Uh, I'm going to show you one of the methods. You want to try to avoid air bubbles. Um, so one of the methods is to take about a 45 degree angle, let the specimen touch and see how the urine starts to spread along the edge of the cover slip and let me just let it fall after that. As you can see there, the urine spread out evenly. There is a little bit of a bubble, but for the most part is a fairly nice even distribution of the urine specimen on this slide. So we're going to let that sit there. Now, the second slide is going to be the slide where we're going to be uh, treating the specimen with the stunt primer molding or SM stain or set stain, clover stain, uh, et cetera. And we're going to um, take this is a, a particular product I'm going to use uh, for today's demonstration of the cova stain. And we're going to <coughs> place one drop of this stain into the specimen. Now, in this particular case, the specimen is, is, uh, is, is, is large enough that I'm not that concerned of oversaturating the sample with the stain. But in general, it's important not to put too much stain that would overwhelm uh, and would create uh, artifacts. So um, the technique that I try to use is incline the tube at about 45 degrees, start to press the bottle so that the drop comes out and touches the wall of the tube and comes down gradually all the way down. So um, this is usually enough to stain a sample. As you can see here, it takes a few seconds, but once it comes out, all this urine is gonna to start to turn the pellet uh, violet as expected. And in this particular case, it's not as dramatic because this is a large pellet. Another example, this is not obviously a urine that a pellet that we're gonna use um, for our patient care today, so you could do another example where you draw another urine, a sample like that, and you can see how it drips. So that's kind of the technique that I follow. I try not to place a, a full drop straight into the pellet because typically that's being, end up being too much of the stain. So I'm gonna take a separate pellet, uh, pipette now and place, uh, for this, I typically do a pipetting 
one and two and three up and down very gently just to mix the stain very well with the pellet. You typically want to leave it for a few 30 seconds, maybe two minutes if you have the time, and then you're going to place the second drop. Uh, again, try not to do a very large uh, drop. You could place both drops <coughs> on the same slide and prepare everything on one slide. I like to do it this way, uh, but both ways are valid. And then we're going to put the cover slip, and I'm going to do a different technique, which is a different technique. It's essentially just to let, let it drop without touching it. And you can see uh, it works well as well. Sometimes you do get a bubble in the middle. This is why I prefer the first method. But these two slides are now ready for an inspection under the microscope. Okay, so we're ready for the final step, which is actually inspecting the urine specimen that we just prepared. This is a slide uh, just to share what we find in this particular specimen. So the first thing I like to do is to look at the, uh, the urine sediment with my eyes and microscope. So I will be looking at the urine here, trying to see what type of findings we can identify. And this urine is filled with a uh, muddy brown granular cast, which is not entirely surprising based on the size of the pellet that we found uh, in the beginning. So we're gonna take this line now, we can also show you in this particular station that is a microscope that I keep an eye upon. So we can also see uh, here under bright field microscopy, as you can see there, this uh, slide full of muddy brown gravel has reflected both acute tumor injury. And uh, this is just like bright field microscopy. And Dr. Seltzer will be explaining the next steps related to the image acquisition. All right, uh, we're going to switch over now and talk about using the microscope. So we'll start by reviewing just the anatomy of the scope, the illumination, uh, function of the condenser, the objective lenses, and so forth. Um, so I want to point out a few things. Um, the light source in this type of microscope, uh, as opposed to an inverted scope, is at the bottom. The light shines up through the field diaphragm. Uh, and there is an iris diaphragm here that can be opened or closed. This controls the area of the circle of light illuminating the specimen. The condenser is a series of lenses that focuses the light onto the specimen plane, and it can be adjusted up or down. And there is a separate iris diaphragm in the condenser. Uh, the aperture diaphragm in the condenser controls the angular aperture of the cone of light. The stage focus is here. It lowers or raises the stage. The condenser focus lowers or raises the condenser. Um, different microscopes are different. Um, microscopes that are fitted with a uh, elaborate condenser usually has a turret that you can rotate, placing different objects within the path of the light. Um, the condenser turret settings allow you to achieve different types of illumination modalities. Um, for most scopes, BF would indicate bright field where there is nothing in the pathway of the light. Uh, PH1 it would be a phase contrast plate uh, for a PH1 labeled objective lens pH 2, pH 3, and then uh, in scopes that have it available, dark field, which has a dark field disc in the pathway of light, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So I want to stop and go over the concept of cooler illumination. Um, when you're using the microscope that allows this to be adjusted, it's very important to take the time to achieve cooler illumination. This is a method of aligning the optics that provides even illumination across the field of view, limited to the field of view, and it in, results in optimizing of the contrast and resolution and minimizes artifacts. So when this is properly adjusted, the condenser ends up projecting uniform light through the specimen plane in parallel bundles from every direction. 
In other words, even illumination that's restricted just to the observed area. So it's very simple to set up um, in microscopes that have an adjustable field diaphragm and an adjustable condenser focus. This is the way of achieving it. First of all, using the 10X objective, you focus on the specimen. Once the specimen appears in focus, then you close the field diaphragm until it appears in the field of view. And if it's not in sharp focus, you raise or lower the condenser, not the stage, but the condenser until the edges of the field diaphragm appear in sharp focus. If it's not already centered in your field of view, there are centering screws on the condenser that allow you to move the image of the field diaphragm into the center of your field of view. Once that is done, then you gradually open the field diaphragm until it remains uh, just filling the field of view. So remember, the field diaphragm controls the cylinder of light that projects upwards onto the specimen. You want the light only to cover the field of view that you're looking at on that objective. If you have too much light hitting the slide in areas you're not even looking at, all of those reflections between the top and bottom layer of the slide create artifact reflections and glare and significantly degrade the quality of the image you're looking at. Um, this seems like a simple step, but it's important not to overlook this. Um, here's a real example. In this video, we're first going to focus using the 10X objective on the specimen. Once it appears in focus, then we're going to close the field diaphragm. I've purposely moved it out of focus and uh, off center. Now we'll raise or lower the condenser until the edges of the field diaphragm, usually it's an octagonal image, uh, until it's in sharp focus. And now since it's off center, we're going to, using the centering screws, center this uh, field diaphragm light into the middle of our field of view. And now we'll gradually open the diaphragm, only filling the field of view that we're looking at. You don't want to open it up all the way. Again, you don't want extraneous light hitting areas of the slide you're not looking at. The condenser iris diaphragm allows you to decrease extraneous light. Uh, so when it's wide open, um, extra light, again, oblique rays can cause glare and lower the overall contrast. Closing the condenser iris diaphragm about 10% allows you to add a little bit of contrast, but it's important to remember that if you close the condenser iris diaphragm too far, you add way too much contrast and degrade the image. You can see on this video on the right, as I close the field or the condenser diaphragm, look what happens to the image you add way too much contrast and lose resolution in the process. Now, as we open the condenser iris diaphragm again, you'll see less contrast, but the resolution improves dramatically. Um, so the best way of approaching this is to only close the condenser iris diaphragm, maybe five or 10% and avoid closing it too much because you lose resolution. I should point out that the condenser iris diaphragm is usually only usable in bright field and uh, most microscopes disable its use in other modalities um, or it shouldn't be used in anything other than bright field. So you may have noticed on the objective lenses, there's a whole bunch of numbers and such. Uh, it's worth pointing out a few things. Um, the magnification I think is obvious. Um, and then next to that is a number called the numerical aperture, which we'll talk about in just a minute. On the bottom left, I want to point out this number here, 0 0.17. This refers to the cover glass thickness in millimeters that this objective lens is designed to work with. Um, so obviously it's important when you're preparing your slide to make sure that the cover glasses that you use are this thickness. Um, most of them will say type one or class one, which is 0.13 to 0.17. If the objective is meant to be used with an immersion substance like oil or water, it will be designated both here where it says oil or with the color band. 
So briefly, the concept of numerical aperture, if we look at the image on the left, uh, we see light rays in red passing through the slide and the cover slip. And because there is a difference in optical density between the cover glass and the air between the cover glass and the objective lens, anytime there's a change in optical density, um, light rays are refracted or reflected. So here, some of them are refracted at an angle that escapes being gathered by the objective, and some rays are actually reflected. This results in a numerical aperture um, with air that maximizes at 1.0 and is often less than that. The higher the numerical aperture, the more information is gathered by the objective lens, and hence the higher resolving power or resolution of the image you achieve. On the image on the right, using an immersion media here, oil, which has the same optical density as the cover glass and the objective lens, there is no change in the optical pathway, and that allows light to pass through without refraction, without reflection. And here, we're able to gather all of the optical information, hence a numerical aperture that's much higher and a resultant image with much higher resolution. So the bottom lines is, is that lenses or objective lenses that have a higher numerical aperture will yield a higher resolution image when used with immersion media. So to get the best image quality, you have to ensure that all of the lenses are clean, obviously. Always make sure that you use glass slides and glass cover slips. Don't ever use these plastic multiple chamber slides that a lot of the central laboratories use. They use these to standardize counting of cells per specific volume, but they're plastic. They're much thicker than the objective lenses are designed uh, for and the optical clarity is inferior. Make sure you use the appropriate cover slip thickness here, at number one. Uh, this is 0.13 to 0.17, which for most microscopes is the proper thickness. Verify proper illumination of the specimen. In other words, adjusting for cooler illumination anytime you change objective lenses. And then if you have them available, use higher numerical aperture lenses, which often means using an oil immersion lens. And while you get really good contrast with phase contrast of unstained specimens, really the highest resolution images will be with bright field illumination of a stained specimen. So now let's talk about the different illumination modalities, uh, bright field, dark field, phase contrast, polarized light. Bright field is the simplest. Uh, here, the specimen is illuminated from below and observed from above. The light and contrast is a result of absorbance of some of the transmitted light. Uh, typically, you'll see a darker sample on a bright background, hence the name. Here, there is nothing in the pathway of the light going through the condenser lens. This is available on all microscopes. It's simple to use. It provides the highest resolution images if you have a stained or naturally pigmented sample. If the sample is not stained or pigmented, there's just not enough contrast to achieve a reasonable image. Um, it's difficult to visualize objects with a low refractive index. In other words, hyaline cast matrix is invisible under bright field. Um, you can use the condenser iris diaphragm to add contrast, but you end up losing resolution and in introducing artifact. Um, for this, uh, there should be nothing in the pathway of the light in the condenser. If there's a turret on the condenser, it would be set to BF or zero. Dark field is quite a bit different. This is achieved by introducing an opaque disk in the condenser, uh, blocking the pathway of the central light and only allowing the peripheral light to pass through. These peripheral light rays are gathered by the condenser and focused on the slide at an angle where the direct light rays go off to the side and are not captured by the objective lens. The only thing that the objective lens picks up is the illuminated specimen. So in here, you have a bright image against a dark background. And you can see here the same sample under bright field and dark field. Elements with a high refractive index, such as crystals and lipids, appear especially bright under dark field. Um, so it allows you to visualize objects that are otherwise 
uh, transparent uh, or unstained. It greatly facilitates finding lipids and crystals. Um, and it's an alternative to phase contrast in identifying dysmorphic red cells or acanthocytes when you don't have phase contrast available. Um, it's lower resolution than the other modalities. Um, if it is a not thinly spread specimen, there is uh, too much thickness and artifact to see much. To achieve this, the condenser would be set to either dark field or sometimes uh, pH 3. Um, and then sometimes you have to open the field diaphragm to let more light in to actually get enough light to see the image. Here's some examples. On the top left, we see some calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals, which light up brightly. On the bottom left, also a calcium oxalate dihydrate crystal. Um, to the right of that on the bottom row are some lipid droplets with the Sudan 3 stain, making them appear orange. In the middle of the bottom row are some dysmorphic red blood cells where you can clearly see the outline in the cytoplasmic blebs there. To the right of that is uh, RBCs slightly stained in a cast and unstained on the far bottom right. On the top right, you see uh, granulars uh, motility in a viable white cell. Uh, to the left of that is a dense granular cast. Um, and then to the left of that are some budding yeast, um, all under dark field. Um, and here's another good view. This is a mixed cellular cast with a few squamous epithelial cells in the background, but gives you an idea of how different dark field images look, um, almost like outer space. Phase contrast is a completely different way of altering the pathway of light. Um, it involves using a phase annulus in the condenser and an inverse phase plate that is in the objective lens. So in other words, the microscope has to be specifically outfitted for phase contrast with specific objective lenses and matching uh, discs in the condenser. Um, usually the condenser and the objective will have matching numbers here, pH 2, pH 2. Um, this effect enhances the contrast of the edges of objects and elements with a low refractive index, such as the hyaline protein matrix and casts. Um, this process actually won the Nobel Prize in physics when it was discovered or invented. Um, it actually creates some very interesting images. Um, it allows you to visualize objects that are unstained or otherwise transparent under bright field. It provides a good balance of contrast and resolution, but it's really only useful for very thin preps, unstained preps, and a specimen that's not very crowded. Um, it greatly aids in the identification of acanthocytes. The disadvantage is that the image is markedly degraded when it's not spread thinly or it's too thick. Um, staining adds artifact. The different wavelengths of light are handled differently and the ulti ultimate image is not as sharp. Um, and it's also subject to phase artifacts. The halos that are present around each object can overlap and degrade the resultant image. To achieve this, you have to make sure the condenser is set to the appropriate phase plate for uh, the annulus and the objective. Here's some sample images. On the bottom right, you see a viable white cell with visible granular motility. Um, to the left of that on the bottom is a cholesterol crystal. Um, to the left, another larger view of a viable white cell. And on the bottom left, some cells within a cast, and you can clearly see the outline of the protein cast. Uh, on the top, you see some dysmorphic red blood cells floating by. Uh, you'll notice the halo around the objects that's created by the phase contrast that enhances the edges and allows you to see contours more easily. And on the top right, a cellular cast and then an acanthocyte off to the right. Polarization is quite helpful for identifying objects that are birefringent, um, including lipids and crystals and artifacts. Um, so in order to achieve this, you have a polarizing filter called the polarizer, which is placed below the condenser, um, above the light source, and then another polarizing filter called the analyzer, somewhere in the optical pathway above the specimen, usually between the objective and the eyepiece. 
When the polarizer is turned 90 degrees in relation to the analyzer, all of the polarized light is blocked and the background appears dark. But any light passing through an anisotropic object, one that uh, refracts light in two different directions by refringent, allows the light to pass through these filters, resulting in a bright image against a dark background. Some objects um, show polychromatic by refringence, multiple colors, others are monochromatic. Here are some examples on the left, you see polychromatic, and this is an unstained specimen. These are uric acid crystals under polarized light. In the middle two images, you have some artifact. These are starch granules, which under polarized light form an irregular Maltese cross, meaning the cross is slightly off center. Uh, this is very helpful for identifying this artifact. On the bottom right, you see some fiber artifacts with very pretty polychromatic polarization. These are pieces of cloth fibers. Um, on the top images, we see some lipids, um, both in an oval fat body and then on the right, a lipid cast and below it, an oval fat body. Lipids characteristically under polarized light form a Maltese cross, a very perfect Maltese cross, which makes identifying lipids very easy under polarized light. On the example on the left, we see here under bright field of a stained specimen, what looks like a cast with some circular objects within it. Um, the tip off that these are probably lipids or that these spherical objects are all different sizes. If these happen to all be the same size, you might wonder if it's a red cell cast. But when we turn the polarizer, we'll see these things light up and form a Maltese cross pattern, verifying that these are lipid droplets within a cast. Now the image on the right under low power looks like a whole bunch of dense granular casts, a whole bunch of muddy brown granular casts. But it's not until we use the polarizer that we see there's more to it. Hundreds, maybe thousands of small crystals within these casts. These turned out to be calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals within all of these granular casts. So you can see here the utility of polarization. So which technique should you use? Now the answer is all of them if you have them available. And this is a case kind of showing the benefit of each. On the top left, we see a number of biconcave looking objects. This is under bright field. And it's not quite easy to see whether these could be red blood cells or otherwise. On the top right, under dark field, these things really light up. And under dark field, the things that light up are usually lipids or crystals. So we're thinking these are probably not red blood cells. On the bottom left under phase contrast, we now can see that these are actually within a cast. The protein cast matrix was not visible on bright field, but shows up under phase contrast. And then using the polarizer on the bottom right, we see polychromatic birefringence telling us that these are crystals. Uh, and these are calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals within a cast. So there's the utility of all these different modalities in one case. Now we're gonna turn our attention to elements in the urine sediment, cells, casts, lipids, and then Dr. Poloni subsequently will be talking about crystals. Um, the size of the different cells is illustrated here. These are kind of proportional uh, red cells, white cells, tubular epithelial cells, transitional epithelial cells, and squamous epithelial cells. Um, the important thing is being able to differentiate renal tubular epithelial cells from transitional epithelial cells. Sometimes it's not so easy because they can be the same size. One of the easiest differentiating factors is that the tubular epithelial cells typically have a very large eccentrically located nucleus with a nucleus to cytoplasm ratio of about one to one, whereas the nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio in transitional cells is more like one to two or one to three. Squamous cells tend to be large. They have irregular flagstone shapes with very distinct edges. Transitional epithelial cells differ depending upon how deep or superficial they are. They can be round to caudate, typically have round borders. Um, tubular epithelial cells are ovoid, cuboid, polyhedral, elongated, or columnar. It depends on which area of the tubule they're from. Um, the cytoplasm, again, is abundant in transitional and squamous cells and much less in tubular epithelial cells. 
Here's an example of tubular epithelial cells in the image on the left. These are adherent to a dense granular cast. You see the very large eccentric nucleus. In the video in the top middle, you see two tubular epithelial cells where the margin of the nucleus is well delineated. Gives you an idea of the size difference between the red cell on the left, the viable white cell on the bottom, and a no longer viable white cell above them. Decoy cells, um, I've found them difficult to identify, but they are indicative of viral infected tubular epithelial cells. Um, they typically have enlargement of the nucleus with a ground glass or vesicular appearance. And one form has a perinuclear halo or a bird's eye appearance. Uh, these are not uh, necessarily specific for BK virus. They can be seen in other viral infections, uh, but they have been described. Neutrophils, and uh, for our purposes, we're going to be talking about segmented neutrophils or PMNs. Um, they occur as a result of infection or inflammation anywhere in the urinary tract. They're identified by granular cytoplasm and a segmented multi-lobe nucleus. Using the Sternheimer Malbin stain, these are much easier to identify. And it's important to point out there's two different staining patterns observed with the SM stain. Dark staining neutrophils, um, have uh, avid magenta or red staining of the segmented nucleus, these cells are older and no longer viable. They're unable to resist stain uptake. The pale staining neutrophils have very pale, indistinct blue staining of the cytoplasm and nucleus. And if the cytoplasm is, has a low viscosity, you'll see visible cytoplasmic granular movement. These cells are young and remain viable. And these cells where you see cytoplasmic granular motility are referred to as glitter cells. They were originally described as Sternheimer Malbin cells, sometimes referred to as granular motility cells. At one point, they were thought to be pathognomonic for pyelonephritis, but they've since been shown to be a very nonspecific finding and really simply viable white blood cells in hypotonic urine. Now we're going to spend a good deal of time talking about red blood cells, specifically glomerular hematuria. Remember that when the glomerular membrane is damaged, red blood cells can pass through. And in this process of squeezing through these damaged areas in the glomerular basement membrane, the red blood cell membranes get disrupted or damaged. Um, when they're subjected in the tubule to osmotic and physical forces, they alter the shape of the red cell and the cytoplasm is able to exude through these defects forming a dysmorphic appearance or the formation of these cytoplasmic blebs. There are lots of different types of dysmorphic cells. Um, on the top two rows here under bright field and phase contrast, you can see very symmetric different shapes, including echinocytes or crenated red blood cells, which are normal in hypertonic urine. The ones we're interested though, are these acanthocytes. These are ring forms with one or more cytoplasmic protrusions, either protruding on the outside of the ring or on the inside. Um, they've been called donut shaped. Um, and when there's two cytoplasmic protrusions coming off, it almost looks like the silhouette of Mickey Mouse with the head and two ears. These acanthocytes are the best indicator of glomerular source of hematuria, um, finding greater than 5% of the red cells seen as acanthocytes provides greater than 95% specificity for a glomerular source. And we see here, we're specifically referring to the ring forms with a hole in the middle and cytoplasmic protrusions. These are acanthocytes. And this is one of the reasons you take the time to look at a urine on a case of AKI at the point of care. When you're able to identify acanthocytes, it greatly narrows your differential diagnosis down to a glomerular source of the hematuria. Here we see under bright field, under high magnification, these acanthocytes with these cytoplasmic protrusions. They may be large or they may be little ones seemingly on stalks protruding from the cell. And you can see here, dark field is a very good alternative to phase contrast. You can very, very easily see these cytoplasmic protrusions of these ring-formed erythrocytes. 
In this video, uh, under phase contrast, if you look closely, you'll see lots and lots of acanthocytes and other dysmorphic forms. Um, there are very few normal ones. You see the bright ones um, that look perfectly circular. Those are normal red blood cells. The reason they appear bright is they have a higher cytoplasm content in the middle. In other words, they're thicker. And under phase contrast, you get overlapping halos that makes them appear white. Um, the more dysmorphic ones are black because they are thinner because a lot of the cytoplasm is not in the central part of the cell. It's on the periphery or extending outside of the cell. Now we'll change gears and talk about casts. Um, hyaline casts are simply solidified TAM horsefall mucoprotein. These are a normal finding typically seen in states of low urine flow or concentrated urine, sometimes after vigorous exercise. They're invisible under bright field, but quite readily identified under phase contrast. Pigmented casts are hyaline casts that are naturally pigmented, um, either by endogenous uh, substances or exogenous. On the bottom left, we see a bilirubin stained cast with a few cellular inclusions. On the top left, we see the effects of rifampin. It has stained these tubular epithelial cells in orange color. On the top right, this is a hemoglobin cast. As red blood cells have degenerated, the heme released within the cast stains the granules a heme color. On the bottom right, a myoglobin cast. And then in the middle on the bottom, dense granular casts or the so-called muddy brown granular casts. It's still not clear to me what the actual pigment is. It perhaps is lipofusion or a combination of different breakdown products. Granular casts are the result of breakdown of cellular casts or degenerative products of the tubular cells and proteins. Um, some people will refer to them as finely granular or coarsely granular, but it's really of no diagnostic significance. They can be seen in the absence of renal disease after vigorous activity. However, they are usually indicative of some degree of tubular injury, especially when seen together with abundant tubular epithelial cells. Um, here on the top, we see uh, the so-called muddy brown granular casts or dense granular casts under bright field unstained. And then on the bottom, their appearance with a Sternheimer Malbin stain. Um, Dr. Velez will talk a little bit more about the utility of this finding in the clinical setting. Waxy casts are often seen in advanced or chronic renal failure, and they're thought to represent the end product of cast evolution, a product of low urine flow associated with longstanding disease or the casts remaining in the tubular collecting duct for a prolonged period of time. Um, these tend to be larger, broader casts. They have a very high refractive index, giving them a more rigid or waxy appearance. Sometimes they'll have the appearance of sharp edges or fractures or broken off ends. We see here on the top left what it looks like with a Sternheimer Malbin stain, very broad. On the right, uh, with some oblique uh, illumination. Uh, on the bottom right, uh, phase contrast, and on the left, um, dark field uh, with a slight modification. Vacuolated casts um, have not been completely defined, but are uh, not uncommon finding. They can be seen in states of proteinuria, specifically diabetic nephropathy, but also sometimes in ATN. And these inclusions um, on the surface look like lipids because they're different sizes. Uh, but they're not always spherical. They may be oblong, they may be distorted, and they do not polarize with a Maltese cross pattern, nor do they typically take up a lipophilic stain. These are thought to be the result of vacuoles of free cytoplasm encased within tubular protein matrix. In other words, as cells within the tubule degrade and their cytoplasm is released, these cytoplasmic collections uh, form in the appearance of vacuoles as the tubular protein matrix solidifies. Um, let's talk now about RBC casts. These are what you're hoping to find. These are an elusive finding, uh, but so gratifying when you do find them. They're usually indicative of a proliferative glomerular disease or a vasculitic process. 
But do remember that red cells can enter the tubular lumen both via da damaged glomerular capillary membrane, but also damaged tubular membrane. In other words, they can appear in interstitial nephritis in severe cases as well, and also in diabetic nephropathy. They have a variable appearance. They can have a few cells or they can be so packed that you can hardly tell what's in the cast. When they initially form and the cells retain their shape and hemoglobin content, they look very fresh like normal viable red blood cells, but as they degenerate, the appearance of these casts changes considerably. As the red cells become depigmented, they appear ghost-like where all you see is the cell outline. They can then become compressed or deformed. And as the cells degenerate, the denatured hemoglobin forms what are called Heinz bodies. These appear as small dense granules along the cytoplasmic membrane. The heme released in this process subsequently pigments the granular material in the cast in orange, red, or reddish brown color. And at this stage, when the cast is pigmented but without obvious cellular remnant, remnants, it's termed a hemoglobin cast. These pictures, courtesy of Sanjeev Sethi, are really cool. These are electron microscopy images of red blood cells within tubules. This is in a patient with ANCA positive GN. Very cool to see these on EM. Um, here under Brightfield, unstained, these are naturally stained with hemoglobin. There's no Sternheimer Malbin stain here. On the top left image, you can clearly see the red blood cells, but also uh, compared to the tubular epithelial cells that are embedded within this cast. Um, in the other examples here, you can clearly see the outline of the red blood cells in these casts under Brightfield. Phase contrast. Um, allows you to see the outline of the red blood cells. Uh, these are different examples of the appearance of red blood cell casts under phase contrast. And then under Brightfield with Sternheimer Malbin stain, you can see uh, really the highest resolution images. Uh, there's no question what these are. Um, different examples in the top middle one, you can see the protein cast matrix and then the red cells uh, partially filling this cast. Um, the others, there's so many cells packed in there, you can hardly see the protein matrix around the cells. I want to point out that when these red blood cell casts are very fresh, such as the image on the left, sometimes it's very hard to actually make out the red blood cells. These still have plenty of cytoplasm and heme content and appear kind of tannish or yellowish. But unless you look very closely under high power here under 100 time or a thousand magnification oil, you can barely see the outline of the red blood cells. Um, on the images on the right, you can see um, these very viable plump red blood cells within the faintly stained protein matrix of the cast. So fresh RBC casts look quite a bit different than degenerating ones. Here on the far left, you might not even recognize this as a red cell cast and look, unless you look very closely under high power. Uh, same with the image to the right, the cells become um, compressed as they lose their cytoplasm and depigmented. And you start to see on the images on the right, these Heinz bodies form, these dense granules along the periphery of the cell membrane. This is, this is denatured hemoglobin. Here's an example where you see a fresh red blood cell cast next to a degenerating one in the same image. Um, it's easy to see the difference. Um, and as we talked about, as red blood cell casts degenerate, you see release of the heme pigment staining the granular material in the cast, uh, resulting in the formation of a hemoglobin cast. In this case, in the image on the right, you can still see a few red cell remnants. White blood cell casts are indicative of inflammation or infection. Um, they were once thought to be indicative of pyelonephritis or interstitial nephritis, but it's important to remember that they are a common finding in proliferative glomerulonephritis. In fact, most of the time when I see a white blood cell cast, it's a patient with glomerulonephritis. And various studies have suggested that the most common urinary finding with interstitial nephritis is pyurian hematuria, not white blood cell casts. It's very important before you call something a white blood cell cast to make sure that you can see protein matrix surrounding the white cells. 
Here in the Sternheimer Malbin stained examples, it's quite obvious. You see protein matrix surrounding the white cells. In the phase contrast image in the middle bottom, you also see protein matrix. The reason I say that is because white blood cells have a tendency to clump together. And when you place a cover slip on a slide, these clumped white blood cells become elongated and almost look like a white cell cast. Uh, they are best termed a pseudocast. You can also see pseudocasts form as a result of amorphous urates or phosphates um, sticking together with cells, uh, sometimes along mucous threads. Uh, but again, when you see things such as in this picture um, that don't have clear protein matrix surrounding inclusions, um, don't call them a cast, they're more likely a pseudocast, especially if they're all oriented in the same direction as these are here. These are the result of applying a cover slip and the contents under the cover slip moving in the same direction and you end up with these pseudocasts. Tubular epithelial cell casts are formed by inclusion of desquamated in tu uh, tubular epithelial cells. They are indicative of acute tubular injury or acute tubular necrosis, a very valuable confirmatory finding. And as you might imagine, you can have mixed cellular casts. It's quite common to have red cells, white cells, tubular cells, all within the same cast in cases of proliferative GN or vasculitic syndromes. Here we see several examples of very fresh red blood cells in the same cast as the uh, pale staining white blood cells. Uh, other examples, um, usually acute proliferative GN or vasculitic cases. Lipids can enter the urinary space in the same way red cells do when the glomerular membrane's been damaged. There are two other situations other than glomerular disease or proteinuric states where lipids can end up in the urine. One is Fabry disease. The other is polycystic kidney disease. Um, but in general, lipids enter through a damage in the glomerular basement membrane. These lipid droplets get reabsorbed by the tubular epithelial cells. And when these cells become lipid laden, they subsequently are sloughed off entering the urinary space as what are termed oval fat bodies or lipid droplet engorged tubular epithelial cells. These can degenerate and release these free lipid droplets into the urine where they're seen as free lipid droplets um, under polarized light, a very typical Maltese cross pattern. Um, you can have cholesterol crystals in the urine. These are a rare finding. Uh, they're more common in refrigerated specimens, but they appear as stacked geometric like plates, uh, much easier to identify with phase contrast in this picture with some red blood cells in the background. Oval fat bodies or lipid engorged tubular epithelial cells. Sometimes they're so engorged you can't even see the nucleus anymore. Again, we see the typical Maltese cross pattern here under polarized light. Lipid casts, um, when they have Similar size droplets, they can be hard to tell from red blood cell cast, but using the polarizer, they form a typical Maltese cross pattern. Here's some examples of oval fat bodies. On the top left, you can see some tubular cells with only a few droplets and the others that are completely engorged. In the middle image is a Sudan 3 stained image of some oval fat bodies uh, together. On the top right, we see under dark field, an oval fat body and below it polarized with the Maltese cross pattern. And the bottom row, bright field, dark field and polarized of an oval fat body. Lipid casts, again, the utility of polarization to verify that these are lipid droplets. So very briefly, um, there are different patterns. I think this is obvious when you see hematuria, especially with acanthocytes, in association with red blood cell casts and proteinuria, this would be indicative of glomerulonephritis or a vasculitic process. Heavy proteinuria and lipiduria without cellular casts would suggest a non-proliferative glomerular disorder such as focal sclerosis, membranous, minimal change, diabetes, amyloid. Granular casts, particularly with tubular epithelial cells and definitely with tubular cell casts are indicative of acute tubular injury or acute tubular necrosis. 
pyuria in the presence of white cell cast is indicative of an inflammatory process, which could be pyelonephritis, interstitial nephritis, or a proliferative glomerulonephritis. And although it's frustrating when you go to all of the trouble of collecting the specimen, analyzing, and you see nothing, um, that gives you an idea that the AKI may be from prerenal azotemia, other prerenal um, situations or obstruction. So imaging options, um, iPhone and Android, um, there are various adapters that can fit in the microscope, either with a built-in eyepiece, such as the iDo Lab Cam, um, or platforms that allow you to mount your smartphone and uh, position it to where the camera points through the eyepiece. Um, you can have a trinocular tube uh, on the microscope, allowing connection of a digital SLR camera. Um, my pictures that I've just gone through, most of them were actually taken with an iPhone, um, some of them with a digital SLR. Um, many microscope companies offer CCD or CMOS camera devices that attach directly to the microscope and have software that allow you to modify the image in real time on a monitor. So uh, make sure when you're taking a picture that you take time to frame it and include the pertinent findings, adjust the condenser in the camera to optimize the image. You wanna capture the highest resolution image possible. And again, beware of increasing contrast too much with the condenser iris diaphragm because it lowers the resolution of the image. Workflow, um, as Dr. Velez pointed out, make sure to label tubes and slides. I have made this mistake only once where I looked at several samples and forgot to mark who was which patient. One of them had abnormal findings and I couldn't remember which one it was, so I had to start over. Um, don't make that mistake. Uh, remember to focus the image and then set up color illumination anytime you change the objective lens. Scan the slide first using low power and then higher powers using the different illumination modalities you have. Uh, don't be shy using the high power objectives and oil objectives for finer details. Remember to focus up and down to try to identify different objects and different focal planes. Always clean oil from the oil objectives after each session or you'll end up ruining those objective lenses. Remember to remove polarization filters when you're not using them. And then start looking at urine. Um, the one thing I wanna really emphasize is here at the bottom, take time to look at the urine when you have a case of an acute GN or vasculitis. This is the best opportunity where you're gonna find red blood cell casts, white cell casts, dysmorphic cells all at once. This is where you really have the option to gain the most experience possible. A few resources to point out, uh, the Color Atlas of Urinary Sediment published by the College of American Pathologists, an excellent, very thorough resource. Um, and also excellent text uh, by Dr. Giovanni Fogazzi, Urinary Sediment. Uh, it's no longer published, but still available. The Renal Fellow Network has a recurring uh, column called Urine Sediment of the Month with very concise topics every month. NEFSIM has some great images, uh, galleries, and some sample cases. And then uh, make sure everyone is using YouTube, you, I'm sorry, Twitter. Uh, there's just a wealth of information on nephrology in general, but also urine microscopy. Uh, myself, Dr. Velez, uh, Dr. Poloni, and also uh, at Swiss Nephro, Florian Buckreimer. Um, these are the labels for these feeds. And then the hashtags that are often used are hashtag urinary sediment and hashtag urine microscopy. YouTube has some good videos, uh, particularly these ones at the bottom on using the microscope and about cooler illumination. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the moderators and then Dr. Velez for the next section. Ma'am, Dr. Anradha, ma'am, can you please invite the coach? Dr. Selza for that excellent talk. It was simply mesmerizing. I think we, we, there must be a lot of questions. And uh, I would uh, hand over the mic now to my co-chairs, Dr. Narayan Prasad and uh, Dr. Gangadhar uh, for uh, taking the questions. Yeah, really, uh, Dr. Anuradha, this was a mesmerizing lecture uh, by Jay Selger. Uh, really, everyone is wondered. So, 
first few are the comments so thank you dr ajay selgers and thank you and regards for uh, your time from indian side so one of the questions are just i am going to read out a uh, few questions are there in the questions box and few in the chat box so i will take one by one so they will love to listen from you what magnification is best to assess rbc cast and what microscope may be recommended for a good urine microscope well good questions um magnification um the uh, 10x objective is going to be hard to identify uh what's in the cast you usually use the 40x objective um but i end up using the 100x oil objective um most of the time to confirm what i'm seeing under the 40x uh, in terms of which microscope is best there's so many different brands so many different models um i've trialed a number of different brands i like the optics from Leica, Zeiss and Olympus, uh Nikon makes good scopes as well. The microscope that I use is an Olympus BX43. Um uh after testing a number of scopes, that's the one that I ended up uh using for my purposes. Um when you do look at getting a scope, it's nice if you're able to find one that has phase contrast objectives and a condenser. Um and do remember that you get what you pay for. There are a lot of inexpensive options on the market but the optics are inferior. Um if you are looking to find a microscope for your clinic or for your office or in the hospital, um check with the laboratory. Sometimes the laboratories when they upgrade their equipment, they keep their old microscopes and some of these microscopes will last for decades and decades. So you might find one that's sitting somewhere that no one's using. Uh sometimes um microscopes that are used for studies or purchased with grant money go unused after the study is completed um there are used microscopes online but there's some risk involved you just don't know what you're getting there yeah thank you thank you dr jay another question uh, is from someone nephroman can we use the sunglass lens for polarization in case we don't have the equipment oh that's actually a very good question um Yes, um if your microscope does not have a slot for a polarizer, you can achieve polarization by obtaining two polarizing filters, but you have to make sure that they're linear polarizing filters, not circular polarizers. Circular polarizers are used on cameras, um but it has to be linear. Um but if you get two of them, you can place one of them on top of the light source and the other one either on top of the slide um or on top of the eyepiece you're looking through um so yes you'll end up having a slightly degraded image quality but you can see what you need to see to determine whether you're looking at a lipid or a certain crystal but yes that can be achieved okay thank you thank you sir uh one question from dr manju sai is there is thousand times available in a specific microscope i'm sorry can you repeat that is a 1000 times available in a specific microscope 1000 times magnification 1000 times yeah. magnification available in any microscope um regarding a 1000 time magnification um it's very useful uh, it allows you to see all of the details you need to see most uh 100x objectives which are used to achieve a thousand times magnification are oil immersion lenses um you just have to make sure you're using the proper oil and cleaning it after use um there are some 100x objectives that are so called dry but they don't have a high numerical aperture and not as ideal um there are some 100x objectives for phase contrast um also but um they're not quite as high resolution I'm not did I answer the question? Yeah. Can uh, Gangadhar Trivedi Gangadhar if you can take uh, further questions. So I request the moderators to take one or two questions because we have lot of questions and there's a separate Q&A session. So since we are running behind a little bit so one to two questions by each moderator and then we move on sir. Dr. Gangadhar uh, yeah. you have any questions? Dr. Gangadhar yes please. 
Gangadhar is uh, not probably in line. And you please take the question, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so few questions in the question answer series. What is the significance of differentiating between Bible and dead WBC in urine? In other words, are WBC normally found in urine? This is one question from Subhashri. Uh, so if I understand the question is the significance of differentiating between viable and non-viable white blood cells in the sediment. Yeah. Um, there's really no diagnostic significance. Um, some of it depends on um, how long the process causing the inflammation has been going on. So in a very uh, early onset, you're more likely to see a greater percentage of viable white blood cells, um, but it really doesn't change the diagnosis that you're going to arrive at. Um, but it's just important to recognize that there's a different staining pattern uh, depending on whether they're viable or non-viable. Uh, another question uh, is what magnifications to use for viewing dysmorphic RBC, acanthocytes? Sir, uh, Dr. Narayan Prasad, can you just wind up with this question? Yeah, yeah, this is the last question yes. I'm taking from yes. the answer. Yes, yes, yes. So for dysmorphic red blood cells, you, you're not going to be able to see them under the 10x objective. You can definitely see them under the 40x objective. Uh, so 400 times magnification or higher is where you'll see clearly the dysmorphic cells. So uh, due to time constraint from uh, organizer side, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jay, Dr. Veles for the excellent demonstration today. I think uh, many of the postgraduates might have been benefited how to take this urine samples under the microscope. So thank you very much for all that great demonstration. Thank you, Dr. Jay, for your time. And uh, we are all grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and uh, thank you. sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you moderator. What do you organize? Uh, for an excellent talk. There's been a lot of feedback. I'm sure you'll be ready to take a lot of questions in the QA session. So we move on to the next program. This will be co-chaired by Dr. Gopal Krishna Natarajan, who is a professor head nephrology from one of the public sector hospitals from Chennai. Along with him will be joining Dr. Edwin Fernando, who is again professor and head one of the public sector hospitals in, uh, in Chennai, uh, government hospital. With them will be joining me, Dr. Mandusha. So I won't take much time for introduction of Dr. Uh, Veles, who has uh, helped me quite a lot in designing and defining this program. Thank you so much, Dr. Veles. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Veles, for the uh, topic of immense significance, clinical application of urine sediment microscopy. Over to you, Dr. Veles. Thank you, uh, Manjusha. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, Dr. Veles, please go ahead. Great, great. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I hope everybody is motivated after this. Uh, always amazing pictorial display by Jay Seltzer, great images. Um, but the purpose of this second presentation is, you know, once we have acqu acquired all those images, we have to integrate with the clinical scenario to, to use this information and make clinical decisions. So these are my disclosures. None of them are related to the presentation today. So we're going to go very briefly a little bit to touch on the urinary cost composition uh, that uh, may have some significant uh, clinical implication in the future. Uh, then we're going to move on to discuss the evidence of, of the clinical utility of microscopic examination of the urinary sediment. Uh, we're going to uh, split this into acute tubular injury and other causes of acute <laughs> injury, uh, uh, such as <laughs> and interstitial nephritis. Uh, and then we're going to finish with uh, Amar, emphasizing... Uh, May I request Dr. Arpita Re Chaudhary to please mute, mute herself, madam, please? Yes, madam. Thank you so much. Dr. Veles, please go ahead. Sure. Okay, so this is a cartoon of, of a nephron. We know that cats are formed in, in tubules. Um, there is a, a protein called your model in terms of mycoprotein is an 85 kilodalton protein that is synthesized by the medullary thickus and in lubrofenless cells that is known to be the matrix of the, of the tubular cast. We also know that the pH of the urine is important for cast formation. You can see in this image structure for the Barton Rose book where the urinary pH uh, achieves its most acidic range once the uh, filtrate uh, reaches a collecting system, 
and where uh, the cast formation will be favor in that uh, chemical environment. We also know from work from uh, Bob Schreier's lab uh, uh, years ago, where the concentration of, 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 of uh, electrolytes in the, two, in the filtrate uh, may change in the context of acute tubular injury. And it was shown that elevated uh, so urine sodium concentration, which could correspond to a damaged tubule, uh, could increase the formation of Tom Hofer uh, protein uh, polymers. So the monomers will polymerize more favorably on an acidic pH and a high concentration of sodium in the cortical collecting duct, as we can see here. And that would ultimately form uh, the matrix of the hyaline cast. The cast could uh, uh, evolve into cellular cast, granular cast, and ultimately wax cast as well. Um, and there is evidence that uh, demonstrates that uromodeling or, or tam horsel mucoprotein is uh, part of the matrix of this cast. This is a, a seminal uh, a paper by Oreta from 1977 from Japan showing uh, the staining of, of uromodeling in a cast described in this paper as a hyaline, although I have to say the appearance of this cast, it does look somewhat waxy to me, but it was reported as a hyaline cast at that time. Um, also in 1971, we have this uh, seminal report by Rotecki when they look at eight patients that had chronic kidney disease, six of them of glomerular nature, uh, and they have significant proteinuria, and they do perform immunofluorescence uh, staining on those casts and demonstrated once again uromodeling being present in those casts. But they also identify a, a, a number of plasma proteins contained in those casts, including beta 1C microrobulin, immunoglobulins, et cetera. More recently, uh, this is a report uh, from Reiter in Austria. We're looking at lambda free light chain uh, position in hyaline casts in patients with myeloma kidney. So we can see that uh, the deposition of those proteins have been studied extensively in glomerular diseases and, and, and myeloma kidney where number of filter proteins will reach and get stuck in a cast. But they may not necessarily apply to the tubular injury where the proteins are not necessarily being filtered through the glomerulus, but are actually being generated in the tubular lumen as a result of the tubular damage. Uh, so this is a, a project that we have begun a couple of years ago with my colleague Mike Janik at the College of Charleston. Uh, the purpose of this project is to try to uh, uh, understand the proteomic composition of this cast, specifically looking at muddy brown granular casts, which are the pathognomonic elements of acute tubular injury. So for serial process of enrichment of this sample, where we perform differential centrifugation, uh, we centrifuge at a much lower speed at about 100 G instead of uh, 500 G as Dr. Selsen explained, so that the casts do not have contaminants such as uh, cells. And uh, these samples have been uh, digested and processed uh, using nano liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry and uh, subsequently identify the protein composition. So here is um, an interesting finding uh, that this is, a, again, proteome from muddy brown granular cast specimens where uromodeling or times hopeful protein only represented 1% of the total proteome of those muddy brown granular cast specimens. You can see here, number of other proteins being present. So although it confirms the presence of uh, uromodeling, it does open a question of uh, the number of other proteins that are present in the cast it can be used as surrogate indicators of acute tubular injury. Uh, not surprisingly, mitochondrial proteins are important in the long list of proteins, and we're continuing this project. We hope to identify other markers of acute tubular injury from this investigation. But let's move on to uh, clinical utility of CAS. What do we have now, and how can we apply uh, to make clinical decisions in our patients? So the first report uh, that attempted a validation of this as a clinical tool came from Marcuson in Canada in 95 and his colleagues performing a little bit of a, a, a different technique called cytodiagnostic urinalysis where samples underwent fixation and Papa Nicolaou staining, not quite a standard 
your microscopy that we do today, but it was also, but it's still important to report their findings. What is interesting is that when they looked at the presence of a number of casts such as hyaline, granular, renal tulipetial cells, and when they compared the presence of those casts in patients with clinical diagnosis of acute tubular injury versus those with, without it, it wasn't really an overwhelming difference in the number of casts. In fact, hyaline casts, which are particularly or uh, considered to be not diagnostic of acute tubular injury, they were found a little bit more uh, often in patients with ATN. Important to know that the, the, the controls in this case in non-ATN patients included patients with glomerulonephritis and chronic kidney disease, which we know can also uh, lead to formation of CAS. So probably not an ideal study when you're looking at the specificity of this CAS in ATN. But the finding that to me is more interesting in this paper from Marcusen is that they look at the prognosis of this guy. They look at patients that had acute kidney injury requiring dialysis and those were not requiring dialysis. And there were more patients uh, with granular cast requiring renal replacement therapy. And they found the same for waxy cast as we can see here uh, in this slide. So both waxy and granular cast were associated with severity. The next study uh, chronologically that have looked at a clinical validation of this cast cats come actually for you from your very own India paper by Dinda and collaborators in 2000. Uh, and this study was the first attempt to correlate urinary microscopy findings with kidney biopsy specimen findings. 32 patients with acute kidney injury were included in this study. They conducted super vital staining of the urinary sediment uh, uh, that we uh, already discussed in the previous presentation. Um, all patients underwent kidney biopsy and the diagnosis, as we can see here, were split between acute tubular injury, acute interstitial nephritis, and acute glomerulonephritis. Uh, he, here, the baseline laboratory uh, median values uh, of these patients. And uh, the results revealed that uh, urine microscopy was very specific for ATN, not very sensitive, but it performed much better for uh, acute glomerulonephritis where the specificity was 100% and 90% and sensitivity. The criteria that they used in a glomerulonephritis was presence of this morphic red blood cells or red blood cell cast. For acute interstitial nephritis, they used leukocytes or leukocyte cast. For ATN, they used a granular cast and tubular epithelial cells. But the field really didn't take off until Mark Perazella, Steve Kalkach, and, and the group at Yale University reported this seminal publication in 2010 where they formally assess the diagnostic value of your microscopy for the differential diagnosis of AKI in a hospital. So here is 231 patients that had AKI primarily due to acute tumor necrosis or perineal mesotemia. They conducted blinded to the clinical information, uh, operators conducted uromicroscopy, and they came up with this uh, scar, uh, a score of uh, a base system to categorize the patients based on the number of renal tool epithelial cells uh, per high power field and the number of granular casts per low power field. Uh, and they looked at the correlation of those scores with uh, a development of AKI or the stage of AKI, the cause of AKI. And um, the cause of AKI was also assessed by a consultant nephrologist who was blinded to the U microscopy at initial assessment and at discharge or death. And, and here are the results. Here is a table reporting the odds ratio for the diagnosis of ATN. And we can see here that for patients who had a score of two or greater, there was a 74 times increased likelihood of all of a diagnosis of ATN compared to those with a score of one. So very powerful diagnostic tool. And it was more interesting is looking at positive and negative predictive value. If you have a high pretest probability of ATN and your urinary score by Paracella is two or greater, you have a 100% uh, positive predictive value. And also, if you have a low pretest probability of ATN and your score is only one, your negative predictive value is 91%. So clearly, a very, um, very good performance of this technique. 
the same authors went on to conduct a first, another study, this time looking at the prognostication of the outcome of acute kidney injury. Uh, here is looking at acute uh, patients, uh, 197 patients with acute kidney injury, once again, due to ATN or perineal azotemia, uh, they define based on uh, AKI stages, based on Aiken criteria, urine microscopy was performed. The score system was somewhat modified compared to the previous publication, but essentially included the same parameters, including renal tumor epithelial cells and granular casts. In this case, the outcomes were a little bit different, looking at worsening AKI, changing AKI by stage, need for renal replacement therapy, and death with rising creatinine. And here are the results of the 197 patients. We have here a creatinine at the time of consultation was 3.1 and PICA 3.8. 35% uh, of them were oliguric. This is an image from the manuscript showing the grand, grand granular cast. And here are the distribution of the scores for those patients who had score zero, the majority were stage one, uh, something very intuitive. All the way to the right, you see patients that had scored three, more cats were present, more cells were present. The majority of those patients had a more advanced stage of AKI. So this already tell, is telling us that the abundance of cats and cells correlates with the severity of acute kidney injury. But these are probably perhaps most uh, salient findings from that study, looking at the worsening AKI risk ratio uh, six to seven times greater for those patients with higher urinary scores. Important to know, although the scores are very high, this data does not mean that most patients with CAS will need dialysis because only nine out of 36 patients um, needed dialysis in that study. Um, see if I can go back. No, perhaps I can. Okay. Um, and then the study by, by Chala was published uh, around the same time. He uh, conducted a, a smaller study of 30 patients, looking also at the prognostic value of CAS. His uh, urinary score was a little bit different here. Uh, in, instead of number of, of CAS per, per power field, look at the percentage of low power fields with CAS. Uh, and in their study also reported that there was a correlation between the score and the likelihood of renal recovery. In other words, the ROC under the curve for non-recovery from the AKI was 0.79 for patients with a high uh, CHALA score. Now, you may wonder, well, how does this compare to the more sophisticated urinary biomarkers? Uh, we know that there is an extensive investigation with molecules such as KIM-1, NGAL, interleukin-18, et cetera. And in this paper by the same group, they compare the performance of those casts here reporting their data based on quartiles of abundance. As you can see here in the orange bars, urinary microscopy was not inferior to any of those sophisticated biomarkers in predicting AKI-RT or AKI stage three, meaning worsening of AKI in this cohort of 249 patients. Um, we have gone a little bit further uh, at our center, our Oxford in New Orleans, we're interested in further validation of the CAS. And one of the clinical conundrum that we face is sometimes patients uh, are admitted to the hospital for AKI and the admitting team orders a fraction excretion of urinary sodium. And oftentimes the value is less than 1% which prompts the team to consider the possibility of perineal zotemia. Uh, we wanted to question whether there was a, really a dis discordance between the presence of muddy brown cast and low phenia. And here we look at 270 patients over a two year period where the patient had both microscopic examination of a urinary sediment and a fractional excretion of sodium obtained in those patients. Here, 43% of the patients in this cohort had presence of muddy brown granular cast in the urine and what we found was that 36% of patients that had greater than 50% of low power fields with muddy brown cast, so these are abundant cast present, they had a fraction of excretion of sodium less than 1%. In other words, a low phena uh, was uh, discordant with the findings of tubular injury. 
Uh, for us, this finding indicates that sole reliance on fracturing excretion of sodium is definitely suboptimal, and one has to uh, definitely uh, use the information obtained from urine microscopy uh, because it's more reliable. Uh, we have also looked at 49 patients from this cohort who underwent kidney biopsy, kind of inspired by the study by Dinda. Can we validate the finding of microscopy with histopathology? And here are the results patients that had biopsy proven acute tubular injury and presence of muddy brown granular cast. You can see here a positive predictive value of 100%, specificity of 100%. Not very strong for negative predictive value and sensitivity. In other words, not finding cast, it doesn't guarantee not finding ATN. But if you see them, you can be very confident that this is a good reflection of acute tubular injury. What about waxy cast? This convoluted bifurcated cast here, as shown in this image, uh, we have looked at their importance in the same cohort, 167 patients under one analysis in this case, 28% of them had waxy cast in the urine. And uh, interesting to point out that the, although most of the textbooks uh, uh, characterize waxy cast as indicators of chronicity and chronic kidney disease, 70% uh, of the patients in this cohort had no CKD whatsoever. They only had acute kidney injury. So we know now that waxy casts can actually form very quickly in the context of acute tubular injury and are not exclusive for chronic disease. And here is the most uh, important result from the study, looking at the relative risk for acute, uh, uh, for renal replacement therapy uh, requirement. And you can see here the waxy cast were as predictive of muddy brown granular cast using the paracetamol score greater than two, but the combination of waxy cast and muddy brown granular cast strengthened the predictability. As you can see here, the greater the number percentage of waxy cast per low power field, the greater the need for renal replacement therapy as demonstrated by this chi-square for trend. We're not the first to show that the severity of, of the kidney damage uh, associated with the presence of waxy cast. This is work by Giovanni Fogazzi in Italy who has done extensive work in this field. This is a cohort of patients with glomerular disease. And what he observed in that study is that the serum creatinine tended to be higher for patients with waxy cast compared to those without cast, 1.1 versus 1.1 milligrams per deciliter in this cohort of 287 patients with 13.6% of them presented with waxy cast. During the COVID pandemic, we uh, did not stop doing urine setting microscopy. We took the necessary precautions. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty of what the cause of AKI is. And we learned very quickly that acute tubular injury was the most common cause. Most of the patients that we looked in this series of only 20 patients had elements of acute tubular injury by presence of both granular and wax cast and in, even some renal tubular epithelial cell cast. Uh, what is also interesting in this study is that three of these 20 patients were biopsy proven cases of collapsing glomerulopathy associated with COVID-19 and what we call COVAN, but they also had ATN in the sediment. So we quickly learned that if you find urine uh, in the mic sediment, uh, copious number of granular casts or muddy brown granular casts that suggest ATN, that doesn't rule out the coexistence of a glomerular disease that could be present. If a patient is overly proteinuric or hematuric, you could still maintain your suspicion and only a kidney biopsy will reveal the ultimate diagnosis. Um, more recently, we uh, also added this uh, contribution to the field, looking at the question about serial microscopy. In other words, sometimes we look at a urine on day one and, and subsequently during the course of the care, care of the patient, we may decide to look at a urine again, just because we're not convinced or we're not clear what's going on with the patient. And we tried, we conducted a formal investigation to determine if indeed this provides clinical utility 121 patients were included in this study that had a second or a third microscopy performed uh, as subsequently, as you can see here in this box. And uh, the answer was uh, shown in this pie chart. 
uh, 51 patients had evidence of acute tubular necrosis on the first microscopy, uh, but subsequently, uh, 13 patients uh, revealed the findings only on the second microscopy, and even a small percentage required a third investigation to reveal the elements suggestive of acute tubular injury. So overall, 16 of 70, in other words, 23% of patients converted from a non-ATI assessment from the original microscopy to acute tubular injury. So this occurred more common in patients that had declining kidney function. So the conclusion from this report is that a second or third microscopy is recommended when the diagnosis is not clear and the kidney function continues to deteriorate. What about in the context of cirrhosis? We know that uh, Dr. Seltzer showed us how uh, very elegantly how a certain endogenous pigments can change the, the color of the cast. In cirrhosis, the urine microscopy can be a little bit more complicated. You have here a, a, some examples of various degrees of bilirubin staining, hyaline cast or granular cast. Here's an example of a muddy brown granular cast stained with bilirubin as well. And on the right uh, end here, one uh, inspected by dark field microscopy. You can see that uh, one may uh, misinterpret a hyaline cast as a granular cast just because of the bilirubin staining. We also know that renal tubular epithelial cell cast can be present and they can polarize if they contain bilirubin, as you can see here. And we also know there are certain type of crystals uh, that are present in context of cirrhosis. Dr. Poloni will expand on this a little bit later. Here's an example of a leucine crystal, how it's inspected under polarized light. Here is a, a, a granular uh, bilirubin stain cast that also contains uh, uh, leucine crystals. And finally, on the right uh, uh, column, we have bilirubin crystals inspected under dark field or bright field illumination. So you can see here that there are a number of structures present. So it does take extra uh, uh, um, expertise to be able to identify these structures correctly in the context of cirrhosis. And the question is, is has it been really been helpful to diagnose a uh, cause of AKI in this context? This is a report from Andrew Allegretti from Harvard uh, in 2015, looking at 79 patients with hospitalized with cirrhosis and AKI. Essentially, they define patients based on these categories of perennial zootemia, hepatorenal syndrome, ATN, applying the international club of ascites criteria. But they also conducted uromicroscopy on these patients, and they demonstrated that 22% of cases that were originally categorized of hepatorenal syndrome by the ACI criteria ended up being reclassified as ATN. In other words, the ICA criteria were supplemented by microscopy and that uh, provided a significant um, diagnostic utility. One thing that we have observed in our studies at auction over the last three years is that renal tubular epithelial cell casts appear to be particularly common in the context of cirrhosis with elevated serum bilirubin. First of all, here on the left graph, we have a comparison of the percentage of low power fields containing renal tubular epithelial cell cast in patients with acute kidney injury without cirrhosis in dark gray here, 44 patients, compared to those with cirrhosis in green, 35 patients. You can see here, much more common in cirrhosis. And furthermore, looking at the serum bilirubin level, the greater the bilirubin, the more likelihood, likely to find those casts, as you can see here, uh, 35 milligrams per deciliter, uh, as the mean value for those containing renal tubular epithelial cell cast. Here, the bottom, the top image under bright field microscopy, the bottom image under phase contrast, showing the greenish material uh, from those uh, bilirubin uh, compounds. Uh, Dr. Poloni will be presenting crystal, uh, 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 crystals today. Uh, he has uh, published this important report on uh, the importance of urine sediment in hyperbilirubinemia. And what I'd like to point out from his study is that he also described this renal tool bacterial cell cast and show nicely that the greater the bilirubin, the greater the number of casts, as we show in our study, 
But it was more interesting to me is that those scans were present, even in press patients had no evidence of AKI as defined by serum creatinine. As you can see here, uh, the number of casts were present. In other words, it may be a, a, con a situation where subclinical tubular injury may occur, not enough to cause rise in serum creatinine, but we may see this cast in the urine reflecting ongoing subclinical tubular injury. Let's move on to glomerular disease and interstitial nephritis. Uh, so uh, in this, uh, realm, uh, once again, Giovanni Fogassi has done uh, extensive work, first report in 2005, looking at urinary sediment features in proliferative versus non-proliferative glomerular diseases. We think about proliferative diseases, things like lupus nephritis, um, membrane proliferative glomerular nephritis, infection related GNs, uh, etc. And we think about non-proliferative things uh, such as FSGS, membranes of minimal change disease. So here's a report of the percentage of patients that had CAS here. We have Ohio granular waxy, RBC, white blood cell, epithelial lymphatic CAS. And we can see here that uh, the, the, the type of CAS that was more common among proliferative glomerulonephritis represented in blue was, as you could imagine, red blood cell CAS, uh, they were 85% compared to only 40% in the non proliferative glomerular disease. Still pretty elevated numbers overall. We don't tend to see RBC cast uh, that often in our practice. But it was also interesting to show here uh, that the leukocyturia was associated with endocapillary proliferation and crescent. So white cells are particularly important in, in uh, acute glomerular nephritis. In fact, uh, combining white blood cells, RBCs, and uh, red blood cell CAS increase the odds ratio for proliferative glomerular nephritis uh, to almost uh, 10 times. Was also found here uh, that white blood cell CAS were actually present and more commonly among proliferative glomerular nephritis, as Dr. Selser pointed out, 11% versus 4%. We'll come back to this concept that tends to be misrepresented in textbooks. Here's another study, this is done from the United States, from Lee Hever Group and Ohio State University, looking at only 17 patients uh, with lupus glomerular nephritis, but they were interested in to, in to understand the importance of serial uh, microscopy uh, uh, across the follow-up of these patients in an outpatient setting. They had 877 urine inspections in 1,129 patient months. This, this is a lot of work conducted in this study. And here's the, the first finding. White blood cell casts, once again, were more common uh, in this patient population compared to RBC casts, which is not what uh, most uh, textbooks of reviews tend to comment. In addition, they look at the value of this cast and in, in, in uh, predicting a renal relapse. And here is an, uh, the percentage of patients who had cellular CAS, either white or red blood cell CAS, prior to the relapse, that occurred in 81% of the cases. Um, interestingly, having a low complement C3 only occurred in 55% of the cases. So this suggests that regular uh, performance of urine microscopy in patients with lupus nephritis might be a good way to sur do surveillance for renal relapse. Another study more recent, uh, this time from China, have looked at urinary sediment to differentiate uh, endocapillary proliferative lupus nephritis from proliferative IgA nephropathy, uh, just by microscopy, 126 patients in this cohort. And here you can see that white blood cell casts were more common in lupus nephritis, RBC casts were more common in IgA nephropathy, but not an overwhelming difference in the numbers. Uh, here's an example of a white blood cell cast and an example of an RBC cast, both stained with Sternheimer Malvin stain. Moving on into acanthocytes, uh, uh, perhaps the most reliable indicator of, of acute glomerular disease. This is a seminal paper by Hans Keller uh, in 1991. He looked at 330 patients. Uh, they had either a glomerulopathy or a non-glomerular or urological cause of hematuria. 
here an example of images and their phase contrast, looking at those um, dysmorphic uh, uh, RBCs uh, consistent with acanthocytes. Here is the result, the positive predictive value was 95%. 52% of patients with an glomerular disease had uh, acanthocytes compared to only 2%. This performed better than RBC CAS, which was only present in 24% of the cases. There was no correlation with serum creatinine. Uh, uh, only 10% of this patient had acute kidney injury. Um, another study from Spain had looked at acanthocyturia as well. This case it was 170 patients, had glomerulopathy or a urological cause of hematuria and they look at the sensitivity and specificity of this morphic RBCs. You can see here that the, spec the specificity was pretty good, not very sensitive, only at 69%. But when we looked at acanthocytes greater than 5%, the sensitivity improved to 88%. So much more sensitive in this report compared to the color paper. We have actually looked at this at auctioner. We are in the process of, of, of drafting this manuscript uh, 70 patients that had uh, biopsy proving glomerulonephritis or a non glomerulonephritic cause of, of, of a kidney injury. We looked at presence of acanthocytes. Here is for uh, we're looking at distinguishing glomerulonephritis from other causes. Sensitivity and specificity were 74 and 86%. But just to diagnose glomerular disease, the specificity improved to 100%. In other words, if you have an acanthocyte in the urine, there is a glomerular disease, more likely than not, it's gonna be acute a glomerular nephritis. The only cases where we found acanthocytes and it was not a glomerular nephritis were primarily in cases of diabetic nephropathy. Here is an example that validates what Dr. Zelser presented earlier in terms of phase control microscopy being the most uh, useful model to look at uh, candle size. Here is a cartoon showing a, um, an optical microscopy image of, uh, and, on, and on the right, an image obtained from phase control microscopy. This is 131 patients uh, that had either a glomerulopathy or nephrolithiasis as a cause of hematuria. And you can see here on the left that the candle size uh, under optical microscopy had an error under the curve of 0.86, pretty good. But when they look at phase contrast, this improved on an AOC of 0.95. So, you know, we had great images uh, by Dr. Schelzer looking at a cantal size. These are more examples uh, showing that you have to pay attention to the blebs protruding out of those uh, cells that have a ring on a hole in the middle as you can see in these samples highlighted here. Important not to be not to confuse acanthocytes with crenated RBCs. They tend to have this morning star appearance of uh, irregular edges and also with body and yeast as highlighted in purple in this slide here. Acute interstitial nephritis has not been extensively studied uh, in this field of biomicroscopy, but this is a very important study once again by Giovanni Fogasi to show was actually just a letter to the editor at American Journal of Kidney Diseases, 21 patients that had biopsy proven acute interstitial nephritis. And here is a distribution of CAS that were present in that study. Here you have white blood cell CAS, RBC CAS. So I just want to point out once again that RBC CAS were actually more common than white blood cell CAS in this report of acute interstitial nephritis. So the notion that white blood cell casts are prothoctomonic of AIN and are common AIN is probably not correct. As I've shown you today, multiple studies show that white blood cell casts are actually the more common type of cas in acute glomerular nephritis, and they are less common than RBC cas in acute glomerular interstitial nephritis. But in the, the important also to uh, highlight this report from Germany where white blood cell casts could also be present in pyelonephritis. nephritis. Here is a report of 15 patients that had both proof of pyelonephritis from autopsy tissue, histopathological demonstration of pyelonephritis, and a positive urine culture. And white blood cell casts were identified in the urine sediment 
prior pre-mortem in all those uh, 15 cases. So let me finish uh, just highlighting a few studies to demonstrate uh, uh, why we nephrologists have to be uh, performing this, this test. Uh, here's a report from Harold Zerolep uh, looking at manual urine microscopy versus automated urine analyzers. Only 25 patients were looked in this study compared to automated versus manual microscopy. Bottom line is that they found uh, that uh, the manual microscopy was less likely to find no cast present in this small cohort. Of course, there are different types of uh, automated analyzers that may perform differently. Here's a report from 2005 uh, from Jason Tsai where it compared interpretation from a nephrologist and a hospital-based clinical laboratory. Uh, and you can see here that a nephrology laboratory was more uh, likely to find granular casts and renal tubular cell casts. Uh, here is another study, this time from Turkey, 209 patients looking at a concordance between an automated and manual, uh, and it was pretty good concordance for white blood cells, but not so much for a cast. Um, and uh, here's another study uh, looking at the frequency of CAS uh, compared in a lab from the hospital laboratory, once again, demonstrating better yield with the nephrology laboratory. Again, all these studies show that it might be um, better yield in the nephrology for microscopy. Of course, some of these studies could be viewed as biased because the investigators were nephrologists. Um, however, the numbers seem to be very consistent and the differences could be very large. In my personal experience, I often see reports from the lab of high and cast. And when I actually look at a urine, I see granular, waxy, and uh, cellular cast present all over the field, not reported by a laboratory, which is understandable when you have to handle large volumes of specimen. This is not a criticism to the laboratory. They have a critical role. However, uh, we have to recognize our role in this uh, setting as well. And it's once again to point out that none of these automated systems consistently detect urine account size, which we have discussed today, how important they are for diagnosis. They are often reported as budding yeast incorrectly. So here's just a conclusion slide. I hope I have been able to convince you today that microscopic examination of the urinary sediment provides diagnostic and prognostic value for evaluation of patients with acute kidney injury including tubular, interstitial, and glomerular origin. I'm gonna close with this uh, very interesting excerpt from Jerusalem Code 1090. Uh, says, failure to examine the urine would expose the physician to public beatings. Obviously, we're not gonna encourage that for your uh, uh, residents or fellows, um, but that's, that's something that I thought was uh, interesting to share. And, and Dr. Seltzer already showed uh, this information where you can find uh, uh, sources for your microscopy on social media and others. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop here with questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wellis. That was an amazing, as usual, an excellent talk. I think you've spoken a lot about the CAS and all this. So may I, at this point, invite my coaches, Dr. Gopal Krishnan and Dr. Edwin Fernando to, wait, to take one or two questions as we have a special QA session. Over to Dr. Gopal Krishnan and Dr. Edwin, please. Uh, good evening. It was an excellent talk. Um, you have uh, justified uh, the often repeated the phrase that description of urine analysis, urine sediment as the liquid kidney biopsy. Uh, almost uh, the same kind of gamut of information what a kidney biopsy gives, even urine sediment can give. You have highlighted. It was a wonderful lecture. I'll just take up one or two questions to start with Dr. Mujisha's question. How to explain uh, the, pre the presence of more number of RBC calls in acute interstitial nephritis? The common belief is that you know, don't get much of RBC calls in AIN. Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, uh, you know, we have to think about where are those RBC casts coming from? If they are trapped in a cast, the sources are where they've been filtered through the glomerulus, they will be stuck in a cast. But another part, which is probably the case of acute glomerular diseases, but it's also a possibility 
that in a damaged tubular epithelia with peritubular capillary extravasation of fluid, you may easily see blood coming from the peritubular capillary into the tubular lumen. And once those RVCs reach the tubular lumen, if there is cast formation, they can be stuck and found in those casts. So I think from the pathogenesis perspective, I am not um, necessarily uncomfortable seeing RVC casts and you know, uh, understanding the pathogenesis of AIN. Uh, I think it's quite, quite um, uh, clear that it can happen. In fact, uh, hematuria is another feature, for instance, of acute polynephritis. You know, often learned that in a UTI, some patients present with only blood in the urine. It could be the same situation where the tubular interstitium uh, may damage the peritubular capillaries and lead to hematuria. Yeah, may I ask Dr. Edwin to take one question? Yeah, excellent talk, uh, Dr. Velez. Uh, again, telling us that the urinary sediment is called poor man's kidney biopsy. Probably another way of looking at it. There's one question here. Should urine microscopy include, including granular cast or waxy cast, be included in the ICA criteria for differentiating HRS AKI from HRS non AKI? What is your take on the same? Yeah, I, I love the question because we are actually in the process of, of studying just that. We are collecting uh, prospective uh, data of patients hospitalized with cirrhosis and uh, acute kidney injury, and we're collecting urine microscopy sediment information. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully be able to share this work in the near future. But at this time, the presence of abundant muddy brown granular cast and or waxy cast should indicate that the diagnosis of a hepatorenal syndrome is unlikely as the main cause of AKI. And yes, although it's not part of the International Club of Ascites criteria, we use that information clinically in our practice that we see those casts being present, we, said we consider the diagnosis being acute tubular injury. Important to know that if you go back to historical papers of hepatorenal syndrome, going back to the 1950s, those reports, they will describe the presence of a few scattered granular casts goes back to the complexity of microscopy and cirrhosis and bilirubin, where you may see a few hyaline casts or lightly stained bilirubin casts. So we just don't have to overinterpret those. If you see scattered, you may not be necessarily uh, in front of a full-blown case of acute tubular injury and HRS may still be possible. But if you find abundant muddy brown granular casts and wax casts, I agree that ATN should be considered. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Velez, and thanks, Dr. Gopal Krishna and Dr. Edwin, for chatting the session. So, we will take the rest of the questions in the QA session, Dr. Velez, be with us, and we move on to the next session. This is by Dr. Poloni, who is with us. This will be chaired by Dr. Urmila Anand, who is a senior consultant nephrologist from one of the uh, biggest hospitals of the state. She's also president of Women Nephrology India. Along with her, I would invite the co-chairs, Dr. Arpita Ray Chaudhary, who is a professor from one of the premier institutes of nephrology from Indian scenario. And along with them is Dr. Bhushan, who is again professor of one of the institutes of the state from India. Over to Dr. Urmila to introduce the speaker and Dr. Arpita and Dr. Bhushan. Um, greetings from India. I think I will not take too much of time. I will introduce Dr. Jose, Antonio Tessa Poloni, who graduated from his uh, school in uh, Rio Grande do Sul. I, it's a little difficult for me to pronounce, but I understand he has graduated from Universidad Católica de Rio Grande do Sul. And he has been a clinical analyst in the urinary analysis section after that at Santa Cosa de Misericordia do Porto at Porto Alegre in the clinical analysis laboratory till 2019. Then I think he went on to get his master's and doctoral degree in epidemiology and diagnostic methods in post-graduation program in health sciences at Universidad Federal de Ciencias de South, again in Porto Alegre. And now he's an unit analysis consultant at Control Lab. 
uh, external quality program provider and a partner of the Sociedad Brasileira de Pathologica Clinica and Medicina Laboratory. Professor of the Health School at Porto Rio de Sinos since 2015. Dr. Jose Antonio Tessa Poloni to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on urinary crystals. I uh, appreciate a lot this opportunity and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I am sharing the, let me see if you are seeing the presentation. It's appearing to you? Yes, yes, Dr. Poloni, yes. Please put okay. it in slideshow mode, yes. Okay. Yes, done. Yes, great. <laughs> I will choose the pointer. Okay. So um, I am from the laboratory background. I am uh, a, a professional from the laboratory medicine field. But as I told to Manjusha earlier, I am a very good friend of the nephrologists. I work at very close to the nephrology unit, the pediatric, the adult, and the kidney transplantation units. So I work it uh, during 15 years uh, with urine microscopy in a central laboratory that assists a seven hospital complex. Uh, we perform approximately 6 million attendances per year and the laboratory performs approximately 4 million tests per year. And on the urinalysis section, uh, we performed approximately 400 urine sample analysis per day and 100 uh, from the nephrology or kidney transplant unit. Uh, the major part of samples were uh, analyzed with automated systems and uh, the samples uh, with pathological findings were reviewed with manual microscopy. And uh, contrary to the, we, what we see in general laboratories, our routine was mainly pathological and not normal. Usually you see the contrary on numbers. Uh, we have 50, 60, 70% of samples with pathological findings. So it was a very interesting place to uh, work with urinalysis because there were a, a large number of patients with kidney diseases. Uh, what uh, made possible to me to have the, the chance to see a lot of different uh, examples. So here, this Porto Alegre is in the south of Brazil to, you know where I am at this moment. And I have no conflict of interest. And this presentation will focus on the following topics, the characteristics, morphology and clinical information on urine crystals. And I divided the crystals on three types, common urine crystals, pathological urine crystals and crystals do it to drugs. Okay, so as a starting point, uh, crystalluria is a, a frequent finding, uh, both in normal and uh, in patients suffering from urolithiasis, from various causes. So we can see crystals both in normal patients or patients with uh, uh, urolithiasis, okay? And crystals forms uh, do it to an imbalance between promoters and inhibitors uh, of crystallization. Promoters of crystallizations are calcium oxalate, urate, and phosphate ions. And inhibitors are uh, magnesium, uh, citrate, and pyrophosphate, okay? So when we have an imbalance with these promoters and inhibitors, crystallization uh, uh, happens. And uh, on the analysis of samples, uh, there are some key uh, points to keep in mind. We need to know the usual morphology of urinary crystals. The urine pH information, it's very important since uh, we have crystals that precipitates in acidic urine and we have other crystals that precipitate in alkaline urine. So the information on urine pH is very, very important. Information on medication use in use is very important because the major part of times we are in doubt on the identification of 
uh, some crystal, uh, it can be linked to uh, some medication in use. Okay, so this is very important also. And as was mentioned by Dr. Seltzer, the proper equipment, uh, the use of polarized light filters are very important on the identification of crystals. And also not only use the microscope, but know uh, the properties of the crystals under polarized light, okay? Also, we can use some solubility tests to identify crystals that I honestly never worked with, okay? But they are uh, used worldwide. So here we have some uh, important points to uh, exemplify what um, I mentioned. Here we have uric acid crystals on the upper panel. And uh, on the left, they are seen under bright field microscopy. And on the right, they are seen under polarized light microscopy. Uh, uric acid are crystals uh, observed in acidic urine. So we are looking at a common morphology of uric acid. A characteristic under polarized light, uh, uric acid is polychromatic under polarized light, as we can clearly see a uh, full image full of colors. And it's a crystal observed in acidic urine. Okay. Below, we see triple phosphate crystals. And these are crystals observed in alkaline urine. Okay. This coughing lid morphology is the most usual, the most known morphology of triple phosphate crystals. But we also have other types, other less common morphologies of this type of crystal that can be uh, uh, exemplified here on, the, on this right panel, okay? So uh, it is important to know the possibilities, the different morphologies we can have on a common crystal and the characteristics they can assume under polarized light and also the knowledge on the urine pH, okay? Uh, Dr. Zeltzer exemplified pretty well the use of polarized light filters. And uh, uh, I only will uh, show you and mention here that when you align the filters, you have a polarizer and an analyzer. The analyzer is placed between the ocular and the objectives of the microscope and the polarizer is placed in the light source and you move this polarizer and make them align with the analyzer. And then if you have structures that presents the characteristics of B refringence and the polarized light, we will be able to see some amaz amazing images like this one, the uric acid is very beautiful under polarized light, very polychromatic. But we also have uh, structures that are monochromatic. We have structures that don't present B refringence. And all of this information is important on crystal identification. Okay. And also, uh, lipid droplets can be identified using polarized light because they form Maltese crosses that can be seen. Okay. Here I, I put this image of a cast, a cast containing crystals. And uh, it, uh, it was, the image was chosen because of particularly these crystals, these small ones that Dr. Seltzer showed previously also. Um, they are very similar. They have morphological resemblance with erythrocytes. And uh, usually when I have trainees with me in the laboratory, I show them this kind of structure on the microscope and basically 100% of times they answered me that these structures are red blood cells. Incorrectly, because we have crystals here and red blood cells do not present B refringence under polarized light. And the knowledge on these properties of this kind of crystal is very important because we could erroneously identify this cast as an erythrocytic cast that would be linked to glomerular hematuria. But in reality, it is a cast containing calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals that indicates intratubular precipitation 
of this type of crystal. Okay, completely different uh, clinical scenarios. Okay, so this is a very useful tool. The polarized light filter is extremely important uh, on urinalysis and on uh, crystal uh, identification. Okay, here I, I put ima uh, this image on the next slide only to show to you that there are a lot of solubility uh, tests used uh, to identify crystals. And basically we have crystals that are observed in acidic urine. Usually they dissolve in alkaline with alkaline uh, compost composts. So uh, uh, we can use this kind of test. As I mentioned to you, I never worked with this kind of test uh, during my uh, days in the laboratory. I honestly prefer the use of the polarized light filter to uh, perform crystal identification. So uh, I have no experience with solubility tests, okay? But they are extremely used to uh, crystal identification. And I bring the information here to put the whole package of information on crystals, crystals to you, okay? So talking on the common urine crystals, uh, we will talk about uric acid, amorphous granules, urates versus phosphates, calcium oxalate monohydrated versus bihydrated, calcium phosphate and triple phosphate, calcium carbonate and ammonium burate, I added to the common urine crystals, but they are not common. They are less common crystals. But as you will see on these uh, types of crystals, they can be seen both in normal and uh, normal subjects and in pathological conditions. That's why I put all together here, okay? So the first one, uric acid. And uric acid are crystals uh, observed in acidic urine, okay? Uh, I uh, put uh, some range, some pH range to exemplify to you. Um, you will find some differences uh, on the range, pH range for the crystals, depending on the reference, okay? Most important point, uric acid are observed in acidic urine, okay? and strongly acidic urine. And uric acid presents a strong polychromatic b refringence under polarized light, as we already saw, and we can see here. And uric acid presents a large uh, uh, variety of morphologies, what uh, makes uh, sometimes uh, a, a big challenge to the, the identification of this kind of crystal, okay? Uh, and uric acid, we can have massive uric acid crystal, with or without uric acid containing casts in patients with uric acid nephropathy, okay? And this clinical condition can be observed in patients with aggressive lymphoproliferative disorders or solid tumors in whom severe hyperuricemia can develop as a consequence of tumor leases, uh, both spontaneous or induced by chemotherapy, okay? So uric acid uh, are a common type of crystal that can be linked to disease. An important point here on, on talking on these common types of crystals uh, is the fact that the observation of this kind of crystal in urine samples is not necessarily linked to disease, okay, or to stone formation, but they can be. We, it's a piece of information that can, uh, that needs to be uh, observed also and uh, interpreted uh, with the other informations uh, from the patient, okay? So here we have the amorphous granules that are very common, that are very common in samples stored under the refrigeration. So uh, with low temperature, they precipitate more easily, okay? 
and they sometimes can make some this can disturb the analysis because they precipitate in large amounts and obstruct the view of the the slide okay but they can be identified sometimes they can be linked to disease and urate crystals are uh, appears can appear in the same condition as as uric acid okay but both urate and phosphate are considered normal crystals um, macroscopically they are different we when we have large amounts of urates they precipitate as a, with a brick color kind of sometimes with a, a rose pink color also Phosphates are different macroscopically, they are white. So when there are large amounts of this kind of crystal, we can make the differentiation of this, these crystals uh, looking on the, the sediment. Urates are uh, observed in acidic urine and phosphates are observed mainly in alkaline urines, okay? And as you can see, they are morphologically, they look, the same morphologically under bright field. But when you look at uh, amorphous granules using the polarized light filter, you will see that urate granules are positive under polarized light. They have a polychromatic B refringence and phosphates are not positive under polarized light. You see a dark uh, field, okay? So the polarized light helps in the to differentiate this kind of crystallization that can be seen in urine samples. Calcium oxalate is another type of common crystal. Uh, on my routine was the most common type of crystal. Also is observed in acidic urine, okay? And we have basically two different types, the monohydrated crystals, and the bihydrated crystals. I put this red line to separate the two different uh, types of calcium oxalate. They may be found in normal subjects as a consequence of ingested food, chocolate, beetroot, peanuts, spinach, star fruit. Uh, all of these uh, foods can uh, stimulate the precipitation of this kind of crystal. And they can also be seen in stone farmers, in patients with primary or secondary hyperoxaluria, or in patients uh, treated with large intravenous doses of vitamin C or orlistat. They can uh, also be observed after uh, ethylene glycol ingestion, okay? Uh, mainly the monohydrate uh, type. So these type of crystals are common, the bihydrated probably the most common, and the monohydrated a little bit less, but both very commonly seen in the laboratory. As was mentioned previously, this type of monohydrate crystal, particularly that have morph morphological resemblance with erythrocytes, are sometimes uh, a source of trouble to the identification. So uh, it is important to know their morphology. It is important to know that calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals under polarized light are polychromatic, okay, as we can see here. The calcium oxalate bihydrate are not b refringent under polarized light, usually, okay. So we use these informations, the pH and the polarization characteristics to be able to properly identify this kind of uh, structures, okay. And here, a very interesting uh, work uh, performed with stone farmers, uh, patients with calcium oxalate stone, stones in kidneys, and they observed that patients with the monohydrate type of crystals in urine sediment have a uh, high concentration of urinary oxalate in their samples and the diagnosis of hyperoxaluria. And these patients uh, patients with uh, kidney stones uh, with calcium oxalate bihydrate in the urine sediment have a higher concentration of urinary calcium 
and diagnosis of hypercalciuria. So in this type of patient, in these stone formers, the type of crystal in urine was linked to the disease diagnosis, okay? And here we can see a cast, a cast containing calcium oxalate crystals here in the upper panel. And here on the lower panel, also we have a cast containing calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals and a renal tubular epithelial cell with calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals that we can see within the cell, is within the cytoplasm of the cell. And the polarization helps in the visualization of this, this kind of structure, okay? This kind of finding uh, totally links the, 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 the presence of calcium oxalate crystals to the tubular system, okay? This is very important, very important piece of information uh, in this, these two cases are from patients with primary hyperoxaluria, okay? So uh, this is a, a finding that helps to identify uh, conditions like this uh, disease. And uh, crystals can also be stained. They can be stained by uh, natural endogenous pigment, like we are seeing these bi-hydrated stained with bilirubin in patients with high amount of bilirubin in serum and urine. Uh, and also they can be stained by uh, exogenous compost, com compounds. I will show uh, uh, an example uh, on the next slides, okay? Here we have a calcium, the example of calcium phosphate crystals. They appear with this kind of morphology. I prefer to not use any name to describe the morphology because it varies the way we express the morphology of structures, but we can clearly see the, in the images uh, how they are and how they organize usually. It's a crystal, of a common crystal also, and a crystal uh, observed in alkaline urines. And under polarized light, we see that it is very weak, uh, the beer, B refringence is very weak or uh, absent also. And this one is monochromatic. This, uh, we only see a white color uh, when observing this crystal under polarized light, okay? Here we have one of the uh, very common crystals also, uh, the triple phosphate. I showed previously, they have the coughing lid uh, morphology that is very characteristic and uh, this name used in test books also. And we can see this kind of crystal uh, under polarized light. Sometimes it's monochromatic, white, no? and sometimes it does not uh, present a B refringence, okay? Usually this kind of crystal is associated, it, it, it is observed in alkaline urines, and it is usually observed in samples uh, with urea split bacteria. So because, because urea split bacteria breaks urea, release ammonium, and the ammonium alkalinized urine uh, contributing to the uh, precipitation of this kind of crystal. So they, they can be associated to uh, infections by this kind of bacteria, but they, they can also be associated to a sample contamination of this kind of bacteria. So we need to be very careful uh, in, the, in the interpretation of this kind of uh, finding. Sometimes, very rarely, they can be associated to the formation of staghorn calculus uh, due to the chronic infection of this kind of bacteria, okay? But this is uh, a rare condition. Usually they uh, are observed in, uh, in improperly uh, conserved samples, okay? And triple phosphate can present uh, a wide variety of morphologies also. We can see uh, in the upper panel, this kind of morphology in X morphology, and this one in triangles, 
So we have a wide spectrum of morphologies that uh, the triple phosphate can present. Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is also a um, crystal observed in, yes, in alkaline urine. It is not as common as the previous examples, okay? It is strongly B refringent under polarized light. And uh, usually it is uh, more associated to uh, people who ingest large amounts of vegetables, okay? It's the unique information that uh, can uh, be connected with this kind of findings, large amount of vegetables, and also, of course, it is a crystal observed in alkaline urine. So to alkaline urine, the presence of urea split bacteria will always be a, a factor that will contribute to observe this kind of crystal, okay? Ammonium butyrate, this kind of crystal uh, also is not as common as the previous one. It presents a form of the torn apple for a morphology that is described in text test books. Uh, it can be observed in both in neutral and alkaline urines, okay? And under polarized light, it presents a strong B refringence, okay? Uh, sometimes, sometimes polychromatic, especially on the uh, protrusions of the, this type of crystal. Uh, I, I already received images of this kind of crystal uh, from colleagues asking what kind of uh, what kind of beast is this? Uh, because they they think it was a creature, some acarus, something like this. So uh, uh, sometimes they they uh, also cause trouble to the identification. Okay. Now. These crystals that will be presented, they do not are observed in normal subjects. The finding of this kind of crystal is always linked to pathology, okay? So the previous ones can be observed in patients with urolithiasis, but can also be seen in normal patients. These ones don't. These, this type of crystal that will be presented now are exclusive of pathological conditions. And I will start with the cholesterol crystal. Cholesterol crystal is a crystal observed in patients with nephrotic range proteinuria, usually, okay? They are usually observed uh, together with lipid droplets, with oval fat bodies, with fatty casts. So with the whole package of the nephrotic uh, urine sediment, okay? We need to have a large amount of fat uh, passing through the urine to be able to uh, observe this kind of crystal. They are very, very thin uh, plates and face contrast help, helps a lot in the identification, in the observation of this kind of crystal. And the polarized light also is helpful because not always, but uh, sometimes they present a uh, monochromatic B refringence, as we can see here. Okay, depending on the plate position, it will uh, be different. Sometimes they do not present B refringence. Okay, but surely phase contrast is very, very useful to identify this kind of crystal. They appear in uh, acidic urines and they can be seen free and within urine casts, okay? So always when we have any structure within a urinary cast is uh, uh, information that came from the tubular system. So the observation of this kind of uh, crystal within casts links the information to the tubular system and indicates the intratubular precipitation of this kind of crystal. So it's very important. Always we need always to look to the casts. Casts have very, very useful information uh, to us and helps a lot in the understand of uh, what is going on with the patient. Cysteine. 
Cysteine is very uh, known, a very well known crystal because it's uh, have a particular morphology that is, uh, they are exa uh, form hexagons and they are very beautiful. And we see it in textbooks uh, is very well known. Uh, and cysteine crystals are observed in patients with cystinuria. This is a recessive inherited disease characterized by the deficient absorption uh, at renal level of cysteine and the, basi the basic amino acids. And it causes urolithiasis and obstructive uropathy. So usually when we see an hexagonal crystal, oh, cysteine, but I will not go as fast to this identification. If we see this example, we see a crystal due to medication use. Sulfamethoxazole crystal can precipitate as hexagons. And also uric acid can, can precipitate as hexagons. So how we will make the differentiation between an hexagonal crystal, if it's cysteine or other uh, uh, type of crystal? Well, if you look here, cysteine under polarized light is monochromatic. Okay, uric acid under polarized light is polychromatic. Sulfamethoxazole under polarized light is polychromatic. So we need to put together these pieces of information also uh, to since sulfamethoxazole and uric acid are both polychromatic, the information on medication use is very helpful to identify what type of hexagonal crystal we are observing in samples, okay? Leucine. Leucine will appear together with tyrosine and bilirubin. These three types of crystals are uh, observed in patients with liver failure or liver disease, okay? Um, leucine crystals and uh, tyrosine uh, are usually observed in patients with liver failure. Uh, bilirubin crystals will appear uh, due to high levels of bilirubin, not necessarily linked to liver failure. And leucine crystals can be seen as this round structure with extriation, circular structures. And under polarized light, they present this Maltese cross pattern. And they are yellow with this Maltese cross pattern. They can be seen free in the sample or within urinary casts. As we can see here, this cast ca uh, contains this leucine crystal and also renal tubular epithelial cells within the cast matrix, okay? But as I mentioned previously, calcium oxalate can be stained by bilirubin. I show it the bihydrated example. And here we have a monohydrate example of uh, calcium oxalate crystal stained with bilirubin that is very difficult to different, differentiate from leucine. But when we, we use uh, the polarized light filter, we see that calcium oxalate mono, monohydrate presents a polychromatic pattern and leucine crystals presents a monochromatic pattern. Leucine is yellow and monochromatic, calcium oxalate monohydrate uh, in this case is yellow due to uh, bile stained, but they have this polychromatic pattern, okay? So polarization again helps in the identification of the crystals. Uh, here, the filter of polarization is partial, partially aligned. That's why the background is not black, okay? Here we have the tyrosine crystals that appears as needles grouped like urchins, like, uh, I don't know uh, to describe, but there are a lot of needles packed together, okay? And they are very rare. Uh, in, in my experience, I, I only saw tyrosine crystals uh, two or three times. Leucine was much more common than tyrosine. And uh, the, these crystals are observed in acidic urine and also presents uh, B refringence under polarized light, okay? The bilirubin, much more common than leucine and tyrosine. Bilirubin crystals appears as uh, small 
uh, needles, small dots also. They are seen free or packed together, as you can see here on the example. They can be seen in acidic urines. They can be seen free or within renal tubular epithelial cells or within uh, leukocytes. Sometimes also we can see them within casts, okay, or attached to casts. And uh, as we can see, they uh, here we have some groups of needles. And on this other example, also we have structures smaller, but uh, it's very difficult to properly identify. I am, my images are, are not as good as, as Dr. Selt's uh, image. Uh, the quality he obtains is uh, much higher than these ones. I also make the images with the uh, telephone, but uh, his images are much, much uh, better than mine. But we can see the structures here, and we can see the characteristics of this type of crystal under polarized light. And under polarized light, billiard ring crystals presents a yellow, sometimes green pattern. Okay, so these are the usual characteristics of this type of crystal under polarized light. And this is uh, a rare type, uh, the two weight dihydroxyadenine that can be seen in any uh, pH, acid, neutral, or alkaline. The, this type of crystal is much rare. I never had the chance to see uh, uh, in one sample, only on images, uh, I, I had the chance to see this kind of crystal. It is found in urine of patients with adenine, phosphoribrosyl transferase deficiency, and due to the deficiency, the adenine is transformed by shuntin oxidase into 2-H-dehydroxyadenine that is highly insoluble in any pH. So we see uh, this kind of crystal as these brown spheres that presents a um, black Maltese cross under polarized light and this polychromatic pattern. Okay, so this is a rare type of crystal uh, that can be seen, but when observed, it is linked to uh, this pathology. Okay, hemosiderine, this is also a, a considered a type of crystal. It is present on the table from the Nancy Brunzel book uh, on the solubility test that I presented uh, earlier. And this kind of uh, crystallization is observed in patients with hemolytic anemia, and uh, they release a lot of hemoglobin in the circulation. Hemoglobin is filtered by the glomerulus and presents a toxic effect in the uh, renal tubular epithelial cells, uh, prom can promote uh, tubular injury and uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, here we see the crystals in the fresh and unstained urine sediment within a uh, renal tubular epithelial cell or a macrophage, it's impossible to determine what exactly type of cell uh, is this one. And here we are seeing it within a granular cast, this more brownish uh, particles. And when we stain the, the urine sediment using the May Greenwald Gimsa, the hematological uh, stain, uh, the hemosiderine granules appears a uh, very dark, almost black, uh, in color, and we can identify it. So they are uh, remnants of iron that was present in the hemoglobin molecule that uh, arrived in the tubular system in these patients with hemolytic anemia. It is also observed in acidic urine, okay? And we have also uh, crystals due to drug in use, due to medication in use. So uh, there are some more common and others less common. Probably this is the major uh, challenge during routine urinalysis, the identification of this kind of crystal and surely the knowledge on the medication in use by the patient uh, is a key information because uh, without this information, we only can suppose the the possible identification. But if, if we know what the patient is using, uh, if the 
crystal presents a uh, already known morphology. So we have a match of information. Of course, to be able to properly identify uh, a doubtful crystal, uh, more advanced techniques uh, needs to be used, like infrared spect spectros uh, spectroscopy. But it is not available to, uh, to the general uh, professionals working with uh, urinalysis, okay? So we will need to uh, look on the pH, look on the morphology, look on the medication use to be able to identify. So here we have a list, sulfadiazine, amoxicillin, ciprofloxacin, acyclovir, indianavir, trianterin, pyridoxylate, primidone, naftidroxfuril, oxalate, vitamin C, orlistate, felbomate, all of these uh, were already described. Uh, precipitating urine or stimulate, stimulating the precipitation or non crystal like vitamin C stimulates the precipitation of calcium oxalate crystals. So we have uh, uh, crystals that precipitates itself and we have crystals that stimulates the precipitation of common uh, or types of crystals. Uh, there are very few information on the characteristics of pH of this kind of, of these types of crystals, like sulfadiazine, acidic pH, ciprofloxacin, alkaline pH, uh, trianterin, acidic pH. And indinavir, in the major times, alkaline, but also was observed in acidic urine. So the others, we don't have a proper information on, on the pH characteristics, okay? So sulfadiazine, usually presents this kind of morphology. Uh, they are needles packed together uh, and uh, they present a morphology uh, under polarized light. They are birefringent, as we can see here on the right, okay? And they have this brown, usually brown pattern. What is important to keep in mind when we talk about the crystals due to drugs? Uh, they can be observed uh, alone, only the crystals, or they can be observed together with other urinary particles. Sometimes crystals induces acute kidney injury, for example, or stimulates some injury to the urinary, urinary tract. So it is important to uh, uh, look the whole package of information that the sample have to give to us to proper understand uh, the clinical significance of the observation of these crystals due to drugs, okay? Amoxicillin precipitates usually as needles, like we are seeing here. Here is bright field and here is phase contrast. Do not misidentify it as polarized light because of the color pattern. It's not, it's uh, phase contrast here on the right, okay? Uh, and the morphology observed here is very common to several types of uh, crystals, so to crystals due to drugs. A lot of them precipitates F needles and uh, a lot of antibiotics precipitates uh, in urine. So uh, we need to always uh, keep this information in mind. For example, this one, a lot of needles in the sample. It's not, it, it, Needles do not match with the common crystal. So I will be with this hypothesis that it can be a crystal due to drug. I will check the medication in use and try to understand what I am seeing in the sample. Usually it is uh, enough to uh, uh, be able to identify uh, what we are seeing, okay? Ciprofloxacin crystals appears like this also, uh, this, uh, grouped, needle groupets like this one. And, and ciprofloxacin is observed in alkaline urines. Uh, it's, it's more common to see crystals in acid, due to drugs in acidic urine, but ciprofloxacin is uh, observed in alkaline urine, okay? Acyclovir also uh, appears as these structures. Do not misidentify this is a fiber. Is polar, uh, fibers also polarizes light. Okay, but do not misidentify it as a crystal. Uh, and we are seeing here 
these very uh, not common uh, structures uh, observed in this sample. Okay, checking the medication in use. So uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, put these pieces together to be able to properly identify these uh, non common crystals. In Dinavir, it is already described, presents this kind of morphology under polarized light is monochromatic, as we can see here in the image. I never had the chance to see this uh, in a sample, okay? And here we have some uh, effect of a medication used in a common crystal. So it's a phenazopyridine stained uric acid crystal. So this is very rare. Uh, I only saw it once and it is pictured here. Uh, but as we mentioned previously, uh, some crystals can be stained by uh, endogenous pigments and also exogenous pigments, in this case from the medication use, can stain uh, some types of crystal as we are seeing here, okay? This one, uh, the medication in use was piperacillin tazobactam. It, there is no, it's not described in the literature. So uh, I suppose it is piperacillin tazobactam. I don't have a confirmation. As I mentioned previously, to definitively identify, we need to have a more advanced technique like infrared spectroscopy that I don't have. This one, uh, these crystals are very unique and very different. Were observed in a, in a uh, patient that is a chronic uh, user of crack and cocaine. So uh, it's, we can suppose it is from crack cocaine metabolites, but also I don't have the confirmation of what exactly is, is this type of crystal. Uh, I'm showing you to exemplify how challenge uh, can be the crystal identification during the routine work, okay? And these ones, these ones, the characteristics matches with trianterin. However, I don't have a confirmation. Uh, I always observe this kind of crystal in acidic urine and they were, uh, they appeared very, Frequently not, but they appeared. I saw several times and I never was able to uh, obtain a final information and a final identification of this kind of crystal. So this remains uh, um, a challenge to me. And under polarized light, they present this uh, Maltese cross pattern. So this is one of the, mis the mysterious crystal to me. And I know there are a lot of mysterious crystals uh, in the world that we need to <laughs> uh, uh, solve these mysteries and properly identify, okay? So I wanted to show to you uh, the common crystals, crystals linked to pathology, crystals due to drugs, mysterious crystals, do you know that we have a wide variety of uh, crystals that can be found in urine. Sometimes they are linked to pathology, sometimes not. And the knowledge on morphology, pH, and characteristics under polarized light are very, very useful to properly identify this kind of structures uh, in, uh, during the routine work, okay? Thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paloni. I request Dr. Arpita and Dr. Bhushan to take one to two questions as we have a special QA session. Dr. Arpita, please unmute yourself and Dr. Bhushan also. Uh, I think the nephrologist is happy with the flow of the urine, the way the urinary symposium is flowing on. Thanks, Poloni, for a very nice lecture. I would, uh, I would request PGs to note how Dr. Poloni has linked both the pH and the clinical diagnosis to the finding of the crystals, because this is, that is very important. And after this lecture, Poloni, I think every nephrologist 
chief here sitting would think that polarized microscopy is must in their lab. <laughs> That's a good thing that you could make. And uh, I would uh, start taking questions from uh, uh, the chat. And I'd start with Dr. Manjusha's question that, that she put. I feel that it's a nice question. That do you think, do you recommend any number of fields uh, uh, having crystals to consider it significant? How many number of fields or, or finding in any, any number of crystals is important for you? Yeah, since we can have, for example, the cysteine crystal or the leucine crystal or the cholesterol crystal, if you find one of these, this is important. It is a pathological crystal. So, so this, this point on uh, the amount of crystals in urine samples uh, is always uh, a question, but we can have uh, clinical relevance in small amounts and also in large amounts. So uh, the answer is, when we see a crystal, we report it in the patient report and the, the interpretation of the clinical relevance, we need to take uh, in account other patients' information to clarify if the finding is relevant or not, okay? Uh, then I would take chance to go with my question that clinical importance of finding some amorphous granules in urine. Do you think that any treatment is necessary to prevent other than hydration or a pH changing strategy. Do you urate formation in the urine? Yeah. Well, uh, in the well, uh, in the laboratory, urate and phosphate uh, are a major source of problem during analysis, uh, especially when refrigerating the samples. The clinical point. Uh, uh, what is better to do? I, I honestly don't have the answer because I, I, I don't work with the clinical management of patients. I only work with the clinical analysis of samples. So uh, if Dr. Dr. Veles or Dr. Seltzer wants to answer, uh, this is out of my field. I, <laughs> I, am, I am only focused on the, on the sample analysis and the clinical management, I honestly don't, don't know what is better to do. Whether, whether you report certain per, this uh, presence of these amorphous granules uh, in a, uh, any quantity, any quantitative thing that you report with in your samples, yes. your analysis. Yes, we always reported anything that we see in the samples uh, in any amount. Uh, but we know that uh, on amorphous granules in the samples, they, the large amount of them uh, during routine urinalysis can be uh, only the, 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 the effect of the sample refrigeration, for example. So uh, it's uh, an information that the amount of granules in the sample does not reflect exactly what is going on with the patient. Yeah. Third question and the last Before one from, from me. Ma'am, yeah. can I request? Raju is there. Raju yeah. is there. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Bhushan to take the next question. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, Thanks, ma'am. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to yeah, uh, comment yeah. on the, the answer from Dr. Uh, Dr. Poloni. I agree. I think he already answered. Uh, when we find amorphous urates or amorphous phosphates, uh, we typically don't make any clinical correlation. We, we actually find them just... Uh, uh, you know, a problem in the sense that uh, they fill the, the slide with with structures that don't allow us to appreciate other structures, but I don't typically link it to a clinical context. I don't know if Dr. If, uh, Dr. Seltzer uh, has a different uh, point of view. I agree completely. I think they're generally a non-pathologic finding, very common, and they just uh, kind of cloud up the image, making it more difficult to analyze the other elements. In Thank fresh you. analysis, fresh analysis of samples is, is more difficult to have uh, the, 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 the slide field covered by this kind of structure. 
So uh, always it's recommended to evaluate the samples as fast as we can. Um, you, you, you are, I, I am in a position that I cannot choose how the sample arrives, but you as nephrologists, if, if the patient is with you in the consultation, you can ask him, her to furnish the sample and evaluate uh, very fast. So it can avoid this kind of situation, for example. I, I could not uh, have this possibility. Samples arrive to me as a tsunami of urine. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of them to evaluate. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Bhushan, last question. Yeah, yeah. In, in continuation with whatever has been being discussed, like uh, it's a very good talk, definitely. There's no doubt in that. And the pictures are also very picturesque. And at the same time, many of the times we see crystals and we don't find any clinical significance and relevance to them also. Many times, we patients who have been taking, say, for example, ciprofloxacin and uh, triamterin and also other drugs, probably they might not be having any crystals also in the urine. So presence of crystal in the urine need not be always pathological and it doesn't make any uh, major diagnosis unless some of these uh, dry 2828 dehydrogenin and the leucine and other crystals. So, but the evaluation of crystals is very important. I think nephrologists in their busy practice, they are forgetting the basic fact that uh, everything should be seen as Dr. Polloni said, the fresh urine should be collected and uh, these things should be checked properly. And uh, there's a single, co simple comment and it's a wonderful talk and it was great listening to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Polloni. I think we move on to the next session. Uh, this session will be moderated by Dr. Manisha Sahai. She's Professor Head Nephrology, one of the government sectors from Telangana State of India. And uh, she, she is a former chair of uh, South Asian Regional Board 2. Along with the joining is uh, Dr. Arvind Kanchi, uh, who is a well-known uh, consultant. He's a senior consultant nephrologist from Bangalore. He was also, uh, he's also a uh, significant part in the SOMI team of International Society of Nephrology. So without much ado, I request Dr. Manisha and Dr. Arvind to continue with this session, which includes certain case examples, which will be dealt with by our uh, speakers of today's program. Over to Manisha and uh, Dr. Arvind, please. Thank you, Dr. Manjusha, and thank you speakers. I'm an excellent session, and you have made us realize how important it is to learn the basics of urine examination. A nephrologist cannot handle all of it himself or herself, and we have to work in close tandem with the pathologist. So I'm in the last talk, so many crystals, I'm in very difficult for nephro to identify completely, but we should know what's important. So thank you for that. So now we'll proceed to the next session, the clinically exciting session of case examples, where we'll have all the three speakers, wonderful speakers in one session discussing the clinical cases. So Dr. J, Dr. Carlos, and Dr. Poloni. So over to you, Dr. Arvind, to take the session forward. Uh, thanks, Manisha. And uh, it's great seeing uh, all three of you uh, here, uh, Jose, as well as Juan and Jay. Uh, I've sort of been following these folks on Twitter for the past uh, three to four years and been looking at their images. Some of the, they, they put some of those images today in their uh, talks, but I've been seeing some of these images on Twitter uh, this is really, uh, you know, excellent. So I'm, I, I'm not going to come between you and you three. So I'm going to uh, leave it to you folks to start presenting your cases, and then uh, we'll move forward to take questions from the audience if we can. Uh, go ahead, please. All right, I'm, I'm going to start out and uh, go ahead and share my screen. Uh, let's see here. All right, uh, I'm gonna start out with a sample case. Um, this is a patient that uh, is middle-aged, presented with hematuria and AKI, also had some upper respiratory symptoms. We're gonna look at the sediment here. We're starting out on the low power objective. Um, you can see the uh, image of the microscope and what we're doing on the left and the actual sediment. So the first thing we'll do is focus on the specimen and then adjust for color illumination. Uh, as you remember, uh, after the image is focused, we will close the field diaphragm. Then we will adjust the condenser, raising it up until the image of the field diaphragm comes into sharp focus. 
And then uh, it's already centered, so we don't have to adjust it. And now we'll open the field diaphragm to fill the field of view with light. Um, uh, we can see here uh, in the center of the field is a cast. At this magnification, it's hard to tell what's in it. Um, we're going to go up to a higher power. And uh, again, we'll start by focusing on the specimen first. And then when it's in focus, we'll just adjust the field diaphragm uh, just to limit the light to what we're looking at. Now you can see that there's some cells in there. It looks like a red blood cell cast. Um, there's a number of other cells in the background, but our attention right now is on this, this cast in the middle. Um, we're going to add uh, just a little contrast by closing the condenser diaphragm only about 10%. Uh, no more than that, then you start to lose resolution. Now let's change. Right now you can see the condenser turret is on zero. We're under bright field. We're going to change to the pH2, which for this objective is phase contrast. Um, since this is a stained specimen and it's fairly crowded, there's a little bit of artifact, so it's not quite as high resolution. We can see the red blood cells. Uh, you can pick out some acanthocytes there easily under phase contrast. As we focus on the cast, again, we can see that these, these do look like red blood cells. Now we're going to try dark field, uh, which for this objective is DF on the condenser. We'll have to let more light in by opening up the field diaphragm. Uh, sometimes raising the condenser will add a little bit more light. We'll do that here. Uh, we'll focus up and down a little bit. And since this is kind of a thicker prep, uh, it's not quite as high resolution, but when we get the focus right, you can make out the outline of these cells in this cast, which appear to be red blood cells. Now we're going to go back to bright field, which is zero on the condenser turret. Uh, reset for cooler illumination with the field diaphragm, limiting the light only to the field of view. Make just a couple minor adjustments, but I think we're going to need to look at a higher power to verify what this is. Uh, so right now we're going to switch to the 100x oil immersion lens. We'll move that objective off, get some oil. And we're going to place a drop on the slide. Um, and then when that's in place, we'll swing the 100x objective slowly into view, get a closer look at this structure. So now we can see a much larger view, a higher resolution. Uh, we're going to focus, uh, readjust the field diaphragm and the condenser iris diaphragm. Try to get the best balance of contrast and resolution. And we can verify as we focus, these are indeed red blood cells, but there may be other cells there. It's hard to tell um, at this point. Uh, we're going to now look at uh, the same patient. A uh, different cast. Um, this one looks like it's going to be a much better example. So once again, we're going to focus on the cast, close the field diaphragm, uh, verify it's in focus, then open it back up, just filling the field we're looking at. Um, at low power, it's hard to tell, so we'll go up to a higher power. Now it becomes pretty obvious what this is. Uh, this is a better example of a red blood cell cast. Again, verifying the kohler illumination is set up properly. We can see here though, that there's some other cells here. They look like white blood cells in addition to the red blood cells. Focusing up and down helps us verify that uh, these nucleated cells have a segmented appearance and are indeed white blood cells. We're going to go up to the oil immersion lens again and get a closer view and see what we see. Sometimes when you move the oil immersion lens in, it may slightly compress the cover slip and kind of squeeze things 
out of view, which is what happened here. Um, here I'm searching for that cast. It took me a long time to find anyway. And there it is. We'll go back to it. And um, now you can see much more clearly uh, the red blood cells packed within this cast. And as we focus up and down, you can see these segmented neutrophils. Uh, these are dark staining, uh, therefore uh, no longer viable. A good example of a mixed cellular cast with predominantly red blood cells and some white blood cells as well. Um, again, on the same case, we're going to now look at an uh, unstained specimen. Uh, here under phase contrast, under low power, you can even see on low power that this, this looks like a red blood cell cast. But let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, we're gonna switch to bright field, uh, focus on the specimen. We'll close the field diaphragm, uh, center it a little bit, it's off center, uh, and then open it just to fill the field of view and then adjust the condenser iris diaphragm, closing at only 10%. That's gonna add a little bit of contrast here. And you can see this again is clearly a red blood cell cast, but there may be some other cells in there. As we focus up and down, you get a hint that there's some uh, nucleated cells in there. Um, we're gonna switch to phase contrast. Um, a little bright, so we're gonna lower the sensitivity of the camera and darken the image just a little bit. Give us a little better view, there we go. Um, so a good example of phase contrast appearance of a red blood cell cast. Um, you can see some acanthocytes floating by in the background that are mostly out of focus. Now let's... Uh, Let's switch to dark field. We'll open up the field diaphragm. And this is a, another good example of what a red blood cell cast looks like under dark field. You can clearly see the outline of the red blood cells. Not quite as much resolution, but uh, sometimes helpful. So we'll switch back. Oh, you can see in the background some of the red blood cells under dark field. If you don't have phase contrast, it's a good means of seeing the outline of the red blood cells and identifying acanthocytes. So now we'll switch back to uh, bright field um, and then get ready to look under the 100X oil immersion lens for much higher power view. Uh, we're gonna get the lighting uh, back correctly and then move the 40X objective out of the way, uh, put a drop of oil on the slide and move the oil immersion lens into the light path. And we'll get a much better view of this cast. Here we go. Um, so again, you can see this is just densely packed with red blood cells. Um, we'll get the lighting adjusted here. We've got a move the image a little bit in the center and open up the field diaphragm. Now we'll focus up and down. And as we do so, we'll see these red cells are packed in there. But as we're changing focal planes, now we're starting to see these nucleated cells. They're segmented nuclei. And you can see very clearly here, there you go, several white blood cells. So another example of a mixed cellular cast with red blood cells and white blood cells. These are pretty densely packed and in an unstained specimen, you can't really see the protein matrix, but the fact that they're packed in a cylindrical form, uh, you can rest assured this is a fragment of a red blood cell cast. Um, so those are my, my cases. I'm gonna turn it over to the others then. Great, thank you, uh, Jay. Um, beautiful as usual. I wanna share now my uh, my case is very briefly here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna share with you very briefly are a few cases uh, not gonna um, displays such beautiful images, but I'm just gonna show the clinical application 
when we are looking at urine and setting a microscopy, the two things that we can think about and that we can extract from that information is diagnosis and prognosis. Um, and one of the questions was, does it matter identifying it like the cause of AKI? I think it's very clear to this audience that it does matter in the context of acute glomerulonephritis and acute interstitial nephritis. But the most common cause of acute kidney injury in a hospital is certainly acute tubular injury. And the question is, do we really need that? Is it helpful? It's going to change the management. And the, the question I hear, can we guide volume management based on the diagnosis, for instance? Um, and then th thinking about prognosis, uh, should we, you know, we know that, you know, the studies from Parazella and others have shown that CAS can predict the severity of AKI, but does that mean that we're going to be able to dialyze people early because we know that they are more likely to require dialysis? I think we know from major clinical trials, the Aikiki and the most recent start AKI trial, that we really don't have evidence to show that dialysis initiated early will offer any advantage. So I would stick with just a diagnostic component until we have further evidence that, that intervening based on prognostics would be beneficial for our patients. So the question is, um, you know, what do we do with this information of the Marty Brown granular cast as being sort of a gold standard for acute tubular injury? It's certainly more reliable than just simple chart review. So that this is a case here of a 57 year old patient with subdural hematoma, hospital acquired acute uh, uh, pneumonia, creatinine at baseline was 1.1, has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, hypertension, sleep apnea. These are the medications include a medication for blood pressure, antibiotics here listed here. Blood pressure 115 over 65, patient is requiring a little bit of oxygen and via nasal cannula. We look at the intake and output and is not well recorded by the nursing personnel. There are some occurrences of urine outputs and diarrhea, but we can't really tell if the patient has been adequately volume depleted. On examination, the patient is morbidly obese, it has dry mouth, has ankle edema, normal skin turgor. Uh, very difficult to assess volume status in this patient due to the chronic edema and the morbid obesity. I think it's something that we face very often now in clinical practice. The chest x-ray shows a collapse of the right lower lung. It's not clear whether this is a consolidation versus a fluid overload. And the echocardiogram, uh, the IBC was not visualized due to the obesity. So this patient had a creatinine course going all the way uh, to 2.5. Patient had received a little of normal saline when the creatinine started to rise, but the patient continued to get worse. So at that time, the team decided, okay, let's stop the fluid, let's give Lasix. And, and as we know, this is something that is not very rare in clinical practice where a fluid challenge is attempted and then we change our decision and start using diuretics. At that point, the creatinine continued to rise and the, we were consulted for acute kidney injury. So the, the possibilities of this scenario is whether you can continue with the volume challenge with diuretics or just simply observe. And can we try IV fluids is a common question. In this particular case, the urinary sediment microscope will reveal abundant muddy brine granular cast and waxy cast demonstrating overwhelming evidence of acute tubular injury. Demonstrate at this time, additional fluid balance is probably not appropriate for this patient, is unlikely to benefit the kidneys, and it was decided to avoid fluids. So just an example where a decision can be made based on the information. Uh, a couple more cases to share with you. This is, you know, we've been focused this discussion in the inpatient setting, but we also look at the urine microscopy in clinic. This is a patient that came to me referred for hematuria, normal creatinine, it's a 51-year-old male patient, had a negative urine culture, had had a negative CT urogram, no evidence of stones or tumors, and had been seen by a urologist and a cystoscopy had already been scheduled to work up the schematuria. The patient arrived to the office, we looked at the urine uh, and by microscopy, and we identified pretty notorious uh, urinary acanthocytes consistent with glomerular hematuria. So immediately we called urology to, to, to uh, pass this information. They decided to cancel the testoscopy. The patient had already also a 24 hour urine collection which revealed 550 milligrams of protein, underwent a kidney biopsy and a diagnosis of a thin basement membrane nephropathy was obtained. So just an example how a urine microscopy avoided a necessary invasive procedure which was gonna be a cystoscopy. And finally, a couple of cases, Dr. Poloni 
give us a nice review of crystals and medications. And this is something that we are often encountering in clinical practice. This is a patient who was, uh, uh, had a history of recurrent urinary tract infection, had recently the discharge from the hospital of antibiotics. Uh, upon discharge, the patient was creatinine 1.4, but a week later was up to 10.2 uh, with no clear explanation. There was no leukocyturia in the urinalysis and the patient only reported as a decreased PO intake. So initially the, the consideration was just bone depletion, patient received IV fluids, did improve. At that time we were consulted, your microscopy was performed and revealed this cast with some uh, fine granular material uh, suggestive of superfroxus and crystals, as we can see here in bright field microscopy. So the possibility was acute tubular injury due to superfroxus and crystals which doesn't necessarily uh, present with uh, leukocyturia because it's not quite an allergic reaction. A patient uh, improved subsequently. And a more recent example of another case of superfoxus induced crystalluria, this in case we have patients with cirrhosis and refractory ascites who had started on superfoxus in two weeks prior to the admission for acute prostatitis, but it was come from a routine follow up visit with a hepatologist. The creatinine was 4.5 from a previous value of 0.7 one month prior to that visit. So the patient was immediately sent to the emergency room for a hospital admission. And of course, because of the cirrhosis, uh, the initial suspicion of hepatorenal syndrome was raised. Microscopic examination of the urinary sediment was performed upon consultation. And we found these remarkable structures, uh, once again, suggesting the superfroxin crystals. Dr. Bologna shows some of the needle shaped crystals we have also seen some that tend to form these conglomerates. And this is under bright field microscopy, and these are under dark field microscopy, and some of times can be incorporated into the cast. So just an example of a common medication that can be uh, cost, uh, linked to uh, uh, causes of AKI. Um, so that's uh, my, all my cases. I think uh, Jose has maybe one case to share, and we'll be uh, finishing up uh, with Q&A. Thank you. Yes, I I have two two cases to share, very short. But previously, I would I would like to make a comment. First, the 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 images that Doctor Seltzer showed, the didactics to uh, show the structures in the urine, the way he showed us how we can see the structures within casts answers a lot of points uh, presented here today. Why we don't see some more WBC casts? Why we don't see? Because we don't see, right? He showed us within the cast using proper equipment, proper microscopic resources, using his brain, of course, and using the magnification that show us, showed us the structure that was hidden within the cast. So probably there are much more structures hidden within urinary casts. And also Dr. Vales showed us the cipro crystals within casts. This is not common to see, but anything that is within cast is important. This is a very important piece of information that urinalysis can give to us. And again, the two examples show it by Dr. Veles. And I will ask you, what we need to do to people return to believe in urine microscopy? What is necessary? What is more clear than this that was shown today to exemplify the useful of this test? Uh, uh, uh. The, the example that Dr. Veles saw, a patient with hematuria, urologist cystoscopy, why? We need to pee on the, on the, the, the we need to, to have the pee centrifuge, look on the microscope, two, min two minutes you see that the patient have glomerular hematuria. I am not a nephrologist and I know this. I see this, the, the information on the slide, I see this guy have uh, glomerular hematuria. Why is so difficult to people understand the relevance of the test? I honestly don't understand. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, I, I really love the test. It is cheap. It is non-invasive. 
gives a lot of very important information to us and identify clinical conditions, common and rare clinical conditions, sometimes in one to two minutes, five minutes. I will show to you my cases and we understand uh, one point uh, here. Let me share. Um, yeah, this case. You are seeing the presentation? They are very short, okay? Yes, yes, Dr. Poloni. Kindly clip it in the slideshow mode. So here, uh, the first case. The first case is a 15-year-old girl, chronic kidney disease, unknown etiology, since age 10, underwent kidney transplantation, 2012. Kidney failed immediately because of arterial thrombosis and the patient returned to hemodialysis. Two years later, she received a deceased donor kidney, which was subsequently complicated by kidney dysfunction over the next six months. This girl arrived in the center where I worked without a diagnosis. With this clinical condition, very important uh, kidney condition, but without a diagnosis. And this was the urine sediment of this girl. Bright field, polarized light. And uh, together with this amount of calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals, there were casts containing calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals and renal tubular epithelial cells containing calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals. I picked the telephone and called the, the doctor that is, as I mentioned to you, we are working very closely. And I, I, I talked to the doctor. This is the second time I see a urine sediment like this. The first one, the patient have primary hyperoxaluria. Is this the diagnosis of this patient? I didn't have this information that I read to you right now. And then the nephrologist told me that uh, the patient have no diagnosis yet, but have an important clinical condition affecting the kidneys and it would be a possibility. Hyperoxaluria, it would be a very good possibility. So she requested the determination of oxalating urine. This is the result. This is the reference range. Renal ultrasound revealed nephrocalcinosis, bone marrow biopsy revealed calcium oxalate deposits. Genetic workup revealed two mutations uh, uh, in the patient and uh, the mothers of the patient have one of the mutations also. And it was a case of primary hyperoxaluria that was hidden during 15 years. And uh, honestly, uh, the sample arrived in the laboratory. I centrifuged the sample and in 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes, I called the doctor. Uh, this patient had primary hyperoxaluria. So a rare disease, that can be, that was uh, 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 the urine microscopy revealed or, or pointed the diagnosis, a uh, 15 year diagnosis that was not made uh, previously. Why? I can't understand because calcium oxalate crystals were surely on the urine sample of the patient. And uh, we, it was published at Kidney International, uh, the, this case. It was a very, very, uh, uh, nice in terms of diagnosis case, but uh, it would, could be uh, done previously, right? And this is the second case. This is not uh, as obvious as this one, but it's a 34 year old man admitted to the ICU, the acute arterial obstruction, developed a rhabdomyolysis in the setting of a fasciotomy procedure. Rhabdomyolysis progresses for six days. Creatine kinase was very, very increased, very, very high, very characteristic. And acute kidney injury complicated the patient's course with serum creatinine increasing from 1.07 to 509. Okay. And then we have the urine sediment of this patient, the dipstick results here. What was counted? Granular casts, as we can see. So I will ask you, do you believe? All of these casts are granular casts, or there are something hidden 
that can be revealed with some microscope technology. <laughs> I will show to you this cast in the upper position is not a granular cast, it's a cast uh, formed by urate uric acid crystal. It is very rarely reported, but using polarized light, we can we are able to see this. You see that this is very birefringent and the other casts that all look the same previously, but they are not the same, okay? So it's a, a little recognized complication for abdomyolysis, which may also contribute to AKEs, hyperuricosuria and urate uric acid crystal cast formation. High generation rates and urinary extraction of uric acid further contribute to tubular obstruction by urate uric acid casts. Uric acid precipitation is also enhanced by low urine pH, which is frequently presenting rhabdomyolysis associated acute kidney injury. And of course, the most reliable method to identify it in the urine is the use of polarized light filters. And uh, it, uh, the recognition of this crystalline cast may facilitate the lowering of excessive serum uric acid levels and minimize kidney injury. So this is the two cases that I wanted to show to you, but uh, I will keep the, the previous information. The first patient, uh, it's a common crystal, large amount within casts, within the renal tubular cell. It's an easy, uh, diagnosis made in 10 minutes and the patient waited for it during 15 years. We can, can do a very good uh, work with the urine samples and we can help a lot the, the patients. If we, we have the commitment, the equipment, the interest on the test. <laughs> Well, those were fascinating cases. Thank you, Jay, Juan, and uh, Jose. Uh, really fascinating cases. I hope the, the postgraduates here are actually looking in and learning stuff. Uh, quite frankly, in the private setup that I practice in, none of us actually look at the urine. And you three have, you know, sort of, uh, sort of made me feel that I'm missing out on something. Now, uh, Manisha, Dr. Manisha actually asked a question. Now, uh, I, I'm going to phrase this in a different way. You always spin the urine before you people look at it. Is there any reason not to spin it and look at the urine? Are there times when you don't spin the urine and have a look at it under the microscope? Great question. I can start um, and maybe uh, Jay can answer as well and say, uh, Every time there is a consideration for a parenchymal form of acute kidney injury, I will look at a urine. So I would say almost always I do if I have the chance to do that. The scenarios where I will probably not look at a urine is if a patient has a clear suspicion for a volume depletion slash perennial isotemia where volume expansion is going to be attempted. Um, another scenario would be a patient with clear obstructed uropathy with hydronephrosis and obstructive uh, out, bladder outlet situation. Um, and perhaps in some cases of straightforward ischemic ATM from septic shock in the ICU, uh, if everything else is very clear, I may not look at a urine. But I would say those are the mi minority of the cases. Uh, in AKI, I do look at a urine uh, most of the times uh, to try to determine if there's a parenchymal cause. Uh, in terms of uh, chronic conditions or, or outpatient cases, I'm probably more selective and I tend to do so more when I'm suspecting a chronic glomerulopathy or some sort of a glomerulonephritis. I, I agree completely with all those points. I think in my practice, I find myself sometimes looking at the labs UA and if it is completely negative with no proteinuria, no cells at all. And there's another obvious explanation. I won't take the time to look at the urine, but most other times I will, um, especially if I have any index of suspicion that there's a drug related cause, a glomerular disease, something other than prerenal or uh, obstructive cause. And I will point out, I, I, I should have mentioned after my example cases that um, the real benefit of looking at the urine at the point of care while seeing a patient in consultation is you can right then and there 
um, narrow down the differential. Uh, and in the case that I showed you, rather than waiting three to five days for the serologies to come back telling me that it was anti-GBM disease, we knew right then and there it was an acute glomerulonephritis and a proliferative one at that because of the white cells present in the cast. So we knew that high dose steroids were warranted right then and there. We didn't have to wait for any labs to confirm our suspicion. Um, so um, with a high index of suspicion, uh, looking at the urine in cases of AKI, um, it changes management, uh, betters patient care. Now, the only times I don't do it is when there's a low index of suspicion or the lab automated UA shows that there's unlikely to be anything going on. Sir, so I just have a question. In India, we have 2,000 nephrologists for 1.2 billion people. And with this lecture, I realized urine examination is very, very important. And we would like to do it all ourselves. But I mean, uh, do you think it would be a better proposition to work in close coordination with a pathologist, train the pathologist, and along with the pathologist, run the uh, urine, mic uh, urine microscopy? Otherwise, I do not know uh, how much time we'll be able to spend with this examination ourselves. It is great to know all about it, but how do we implement it practically? How do you do that at your center? I'll make a quick comment and then let Jose answer this. I think most places are not fortunate to have someone like Jose running their lab as a resource. Uh, at my facility, um, we have great technicians and such, but they just uh, either don't have the time or the experience to identify things. I think you're right. The ideal circumstance would be to have a trained pathologist or trained technicians kind of a nephrology urinalysis lab um, that's centralized that other nephrologists can count on. Um, Jose, your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, um, some important points. Uh, the professional that uh, will be uh, performing the test needs to understand the relevance of the test. A lot of people work uh, randomly perform the analysis randomly, doesn't, does not understand what they need to search for. So uh, I suggest, honestly, uh, if you can uh, have some professionals in the laboratory medicine pathology uh, close to you and you teach them, oh, this is glomerular, pat glomerular glomerulonephritis pattern, what kind of information you need to, to you will uh, observe in samples. So uh, a tip stick, one plus of protein, for example, three plus of hemoglobin. The professional needs to understand what he needs to search for. For example, in the laboratory match, you perform dip stick test, you have one plus of protein, three plus of hemoglobin. So the, my first, my first uh, thing is this can be, can be glomerulomaturia. What I need to search for? I need to search for dysmorphic erythrocytes, red blood cell casts. I will search for. I don't know if I will find it, but I will search for. In patients with glomerular hematuria, it's usual to have tubular injury. So also you need to search for renal tubular epithelial cells, renal tubular epithelial cell cast. As Dr. Seltzer mentioned, the show it the white blood cell within the, the cast. They can be present. The, usually it causes some causes of glomerular hematuria are immunological mediated. So they can, he, can have leukocytes. So the professional that is performing the analysis needs to understand what uh, the sample is saying to him because we don't have, I don't have the information uh, from the uh, patient history. I only have the name, the age, and the sample arrived in the laboratory. Sometimes there is this the history, but sometimes I don't have any information. So I, I learned it with Dr. Fogazzi. I went, I spent one month with him in Italy. Uh, after a long period of time in the laboratory working, but uh, 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 there was a moment that I faced it. I need to under properly understand what the samples were telling me. And I only was uh, able to develop my work when I understood how a nephrologist looks at the sample. 
So it is the important point. Uh, it would be interesting if you can have a team in the laboratory and you can teach them about the different urinary patterns that the samples can have and what uh, is more common to find it in, in, in the different patterns. So the professional will understand what he needs to do and what he needs to search for. If we search for something, the chance to find it increases a lot. Uh, I'm telling you all of this because I worked randomly analyzing the samples and I was not able to identify the structures as I uh, am able now, as I am able after knowing how the, the findings appear in the urine sediment, depending on the clinical condition of the patient. So it is possible because I am not a nephrologist, but looking at the sample, I, I, can, I can say, oh, this guy have proliferative glomerulonephritis. This guy have acute glomerulonephritis. His guy have acute tubular necrosis. This guy have pielonephritis. His guy have urinary tract infection. It is possible to organize this kind of information and you can have these professionals helping you in the diagnosis. Two, bi two billion people two. in India? Two billion. Is this, amount, is this number of, of the population? You have a lot of urine to evaluate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be overwhelmed with many urine samples, I think. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Poloni. Uh, thanks for that. And thanks for the comment. Thanks, Manisha. And uh, thanks, Dr. Arvin. Uh, so we move on to the last session of today's program. A uh, few questions have been posted in the chat box as well as in the QA session. Uh, probably in the next 10 minutes, we'll be able to do. There's another suggestion. Uh, if we are not able to do questions, probably we will uh, uh, post it in the Word doc to the speakers and get the answers from them and circulate to all. But then for the next 10, 15 minutes, probably we should be able to take what we can. So for this, I invite Dr. Santosh Vergis, who is Professor Head of one of the premier institutes of uh, India, uh, Christian Medical College Weller. Uh, to take uh, the session forward. Along with him joining is Dr. Shruti Tapiawala, who is a senior consultant nephrologist, expert in transplant field of nephrology from Mumbai. Over to Dr. Santosh and Shruti to take the questions forward to the amazing speakers of today's program. Over to you, please. Thank you. Hi, hi. hi. Santosh, go ahead. Uh, Shruti, I'll take the first and yes. ask first yes. questions to Dr. Selsa as we planned. So Dr. Selsa, a couple of questions to you. First question is, are there ways to improve the yield of RPC cars? Uh, can we use things like formalin? Does it help? You know, uh, if you were trying to preserve a slide, you could use formalin to fix the cast so that they won't degenerate over time. But otherwise, for examining a fresh sediment, um, there's nothing you can do to increase your chance of seeing red cell casts outside of the normal preparation that we went through. Um, red cell casts are an elusive finding. I think if you see acanthocytes, you should spend a lot more time than usual looking for red cell casts because they're probably there and you're just missing them. Also, beware that fresh red blood cells may not be easy to see. Um, also, degenerating red cells who've lost their cytoplasm and become compressed and distorted may not be obvious. Um, there was a study done, I can't recall the reference, um, looking to see whether different centrifuge, centrifuge rates uh, resulted in a higher yield. Um, I believe that they found that um, a relative centrifugal force of 500 or 600 might be better than 400 but they also found that too high of a rate um, probably decreased the yield by uh, disintegrating the cast structures. Good question though, an elusive finding. Yeah, uh, thank you. The next question for you, Dr. Celso, is that the, since the SM stain is not very commonly available, uh, do you think it could be locally made using constituents like crystal violin, uh, violet, safranin, et cetera? Do, do you think it could locally just get it together and make it? I think it's probably better to buy it online. I'm sure there's a way to ship it anywhere in the world. 
Um, the problem is mixing crystal violet and saffron in, uh, there's going to be precipitation that occurs uh, with a fairly short shelf life. Most of the commercial preparations, the Cova stain, the SETI stain have stabilizers in them to prevent precipitation. Um, I know that there are several versions available online, different costs. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, prohibition on shipping outside of the US or other countries, but if there is, I guess you're right, the next best thing would be to on the spot mix equal parts of crystal violet and saffron in, but it would have a very limited shelf life. Uh, thank you. One last question for you from me is, uh, uh, do you stain every sediment that you get with the uh, Melbourne stain? And uh, do you quantitate casts while reporting? Do you pass the same question sent in to us? Um, I always prepare one slide unstained and one slide stained. The reason being that the unstained allows me to benefit from phase contrast. Stained specimens have too much artifact on phase contrast. Um, also, there's a much lower risk of pseudocast formation with an unstained specimen. So sometimes if I look at the stain slide and there's cast that may be pseudocast, I'll rely on the unstained version. Um, I generally uh, don't report uh, quantity wise other than relative terms like few, scattered, several, loaded. Um, I, I probably should try to quantify it better, but for my purposes, it's more helping me arrive at a diagnosis than uh, data. Thank you, Shruti. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Selzer, two or three more questions from the audience to you. So this says that how do we differentiate aggregated RBCs over highline cast? So the, the person wants to ask, how does one differentiate whether it is RBCs which have aggregated versus it's an highline cast on which there are RBCs? Whether you have answered the centrifuge speed, but that question also adds that or assessing RBC in urine, a centrifuge sample is always required. Well, if you have a visibly bloody specimen, uh, sometimes I will look at an unspun specimen because it's not crowded. You're not gonna have layer upon layer of things making it hard to see what you're seeing. So there are times when there is a role for looking at an unspun specimen. Um, to answer the other question, how do you differentiate an aggregation of red cells from a red cell cast versus a highland cast that has red cells on top of it? Uh, in terms of determining whether the cells are actually within the cast, you have to rely on focusing up and down and uh, verifying that the red cells are in the same focal plane as the middle of the cast. Um, in terms of red cell aggregates or red cells, lining up along another structure like a mucus thread. Um, sometimes phase contrast helps if you're able to see the protein matrix encasing the cells. That's also where a stain specimen comes into higher utility as you can stain the protein matrix and see whether the red cells are within a cast rather than just aggregated. And the same goes for white cells. One more question. How do you suggest to go about evaluation with bright field and dark ground dark background in LMIC with constrained resources. I think this question must have come from centers where you cannot afford to have all the types of examinations done. So how do you work around all these things? That's a very good question. I, most microscopes are limited just to bright field. Yes. Um, not, not everyone's lucky enough to have uh, phase contrast. There are ways around it though. With Brightfield, if you use the Sternheimer Malbin stain, you can find anything you need to find. Um, it may not be quite as good for certain things, but it's good enough. Uh, but Brightfield with unstained specimens is not very useful. So if your scope is limited to Brightfield, you really need to find Sternheimer Malbin stain and uh, add that to the workflow. In terms of dark field, there are ways around it. If you don't have a condenser with a dark field setting, you can do one of two things. You can create um, a circular disc uh, or use a, a coin or something that's circular and opaque and put it over the light source 
Uh, but the size matters. You have to have something that only blocks the center of the light, but allows the periphery of light around it. Um, so there are ways to rig up dark field. You'll have to do some trial and error, uh, but putting something in the pathway of the light below the condenser and below the slide that blocks the central light and only lets the peripheral light to the condenser, you can achieve dark field, even if the scope wasn't meant to do that. Yes, urine routine seems to be a very humble test, but I think we know what is the wealth of knowledge we get from it. So there are a few questions in different manners which have been asked that how do you train technicians? So are there courses which, or are there fellowship courses which we can have our technicians come for or pathologists come for? Because this really requires a lot of dedication that every urine routine coming requires a discussion with the nephrologist and the pathologist should be looking at it in, an, in a way that he or she can give a diagnosis to the clinicians. So are there any courses available where technicians can be trained? Um, this may be answered by any of the three of you. I'll start out and then uh, let uh, Juan Carlos and Jose answer. Um, if there aren't, there should be. Um, I think there have periodically been symposia uh, courses. Um, I know uh, Dr. Fagazi has conducted courses here and there. Um, nothing that's been high profile. The American College of Pathologists has a certification program for technicians, um, and it's fairly robust, fairly good, um, but I don't think they end up with the depth of knowledge that's really needed for the nephrologists. Um, I'll let the others comment on that question. Yeah, I agree with Jay. Uh, I think there is a, a, an unmet need. Um, about a two years ago, we had an initiative to develop a workshop with live training during the Kidney Con Conference here in the United States. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it was transformed into a virtual platform which was probably not very different from what we did today, which is a three, four hour symposium, uh, clearly not sufficient for individuals to acquire expertise. Um, and the, uh, as Jay mentioned, I'm aware of some conferences in Europe, I think Florian Bokemer posted some of that about three or four years ago. It was like a two day conference in urinalysis and urinalysis and microscopy. But I do agree that and we do need better or more uh, opportunities for uh, technicians and uh, practitioners and professionals to be trained. Yeah, uh, here, in, here in Brazil, uh, that, that is not. Uh, uh, you learn on the university. Here, here, the nephrologists usually don't perform the urine microscopy. Uh, urinalysis is conducted uh, within uh, laboratory medicine, uh, within the laboratories and central laboratories usually. And uh, usually you receive the, you uh, learn very, very few on, at the university and you receive a train during your start uh, period of work in the laboratory and then uh, only if you have interest in, in make some some uh, in improve your knowledge. Like I, after five years of work in the laboratory, I decided that I needed to improve the knowledge because I was seeing a lot of structures that I didn't know, and I I was in contact with Dr. Fogazzi, and I went to uh, Italy and spent one month uh, with him in the laboratory to refine the knowledge. So unfortunately, uh, uh, it's very difficult to find an organized, uh, an organized uh, protocol, procedure. Uh, uh, anyone that wants to know this subject, go to, to determined place and you do the course, a theoretical and practical course, and you are uh, uh, approved and you can do. There is not this one. So, uh, what we did today, as, as uh, JC comment, it, it's very nice, very, very nice. The didactics of Dr. Seltz is showing the structures, uh, the quality of the images he showed is extremely high. I never saw anything as high as this one I saw today. It's amazing. 
So this is a very, very good theoretical training. And now, for example, we what do we need to do? A practical course. So if we put this together and we made a final test, anyone is satisfied? <laughs> I agree. I think we have to take urine routine very seriously and then and then will this happen. It, 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 it is a very it is a very important point and uh, I would love to see something like this happen. If we will be able to do something like this, I believe a lot of people would be interested and surely we will help a lot of patients worldwide. It's yeah. very nice. It, what is mandatory? We need to have a laboratory with the samples, right? This is very important with proper equipment and with samples to be able to perform the practical course. But uh, this is a very nice thing, very nice uh, sit proposed situation, okay? I think Dr. along Santos, those lines, uh, yeah. oh, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. The uh, ASN I think is soliciting for uh, subject content for next year's conference and asking for recommendations from ASN members, this might be a good opportunity for us uh, to propose a urine microscopy, urine sediment uh, symposium at ASN. It'd be nice if they were interested. They would have a nice large audience, especially if it would be in person next year, which we can only hope for. Yes. That's really nice. Dr. Santosh, you want to carry on yeah. the next few questions? Uh, thank, thank you, Shruti. So the next questions are to Dr. Velez. Uh, uh, the first question we got to the chat box is, uh, could the prediction scores vary with the etiology of the acute kidney injury? Uh, could you repeat the question? It was a little broken, the audio. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I said uh, the prediction scores, do they vary with the etiology of the acute kidney injury? Yeah, excellent. So the prediction scores, I you're referring to the Perizella and the Chala scores, are strictly developed for the diagnosis of acute tubular injury and distinguish them from a perennial isotemia. They are not necessarily built to assess acute interstitial nephritis of acute glomerulonephritis. Uh, and I think this, those scores were developed to kind of validate their value. I personally, in clinical practice, do not use the scores. I, um, I think you can use it for research tools to try to categorize your patients in, in, in research uh, setting. Um, but yeah, answering your question is, is primarily for acute tubular injury. Okay, uh, just to follow through on the same question, is it is it possible to do the Chava score and the Parazella scores with the routine urine microscopy, or do you need to have any special precautions that you would recommend? Uh, I would say that they, you have to uh, utilize in the same setting that it was utilized on, this, on the studies, which was in hospitalized patients with acute kidney injury. Other than that, I don't think there are any special precautions to be taken. So patients where a diagnosis of AKI and there's suspicion of acute tubular injury or perennial zootemia, um, uh, that's when these scores can be utilized. Uh, thank you. Uh, Shruti, your questions. Yeah. So Dr. Juan, the next question to you is, are there any studies showing the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value of agenthocytes in cases yes. of glomerulonephritis? Thank you for the question. I, I shared some of those studies in this presentation. Uh, they have been the, the, the seminal paper by Dr. Keller, 1991 in Germany, but they have been subsequent studies in Spain and other countries in Asia. And we also show what we have done in our center at Oxford in New Orleans. Overall, uh, the positive predictive value is extremely high, uh, closer to 100% for glomerular disease injury. 